Good morning, campers, and welcome to Radio Camp Half-Blood, a Percy Jackson read-along podcast. I'm B, And I'm Zach. And this week, we discussed the Lightning Thief musical on Broadway. On Broadway, woo! And it was super crazy. If you can't hear from our voices, we're just we're, exhausted. We're very tired. We spent so much time in the city. How many miles did we walk? Uh, my Fitbit told me like maybe like 13, 14 miles on just one day alone. One day, yeah, we... We were very tired, but we were very happy. We had a really great time. Um, so I guess we should, I guess, start on our our first impressions on the musical. Yeah, actually, before we start on that, I think we should talk about just the journey getting there. Because the journey getting it. I mean, the emotional journey or the physical journey. Well, it's the journey that as friends, just meeting and having a fun time, but also it's the friendship we made along the way. It's like homeward bound. I, are you the cat or the pug? I'm probably the cat. I think. I guess I'm the pug. pug. I just got. Yeah. I have messed up breathing. <laughs> <laughs> like the person behind us at the musical. Let's not talk about them. Anyway, that's a whole other story. Yeah, we woke up really early, really excited. We got our tickets at. They were supposed to be at what eight, but they changed the last minute to seven o'clock. Yeah, basically. Um, I feel like I should have just been checking my email more often. But either way, um, we had the meetup, which was really fun. We got to meet Robert, who's our awesome meme page runner on Twitter. We also got to meet up with Help the Half Bloods. Yeah, Help the Half Bloods, which they the two of them run a Twitter that we've we've interviewed them about how they help people afford tickets to see the Lightning Thief musical um, if they can't afford it, which is really awesome. So we had a really fun time with them, hanging out for a little bit before the show. Then we walked with Help the Half-Bloods to uh, the musical, trekked across <laughs> Manhattan, posed in front of the marquee. We'll probably have those in the show notes as pictures. And um, yeah, then we, we found our seats and settled in. Um, I'm wondering how, uh, how you, you, Zach, felt seeing it for the first time as opposed to me which is this is the second time I'm seeing it. It was a lot of fun. I was really excited about it. The the one thing I forgot we forgot to talk about is that I almost got into a fight. Oh yeah, when we were hanging out at the <laughs> meetup some guys tried to sell us Airbuds. Air no, Airbuds is the movie about a dog. Airheads, <laughs> Airheads. is the oh, candy. <laughs> actually I'd be a big hey, you want to get No, if Airbuds? they were trying to sell me a golden retriever who played basketball, I would have been totally on board. They were just trying to sell us garbage candy. <laughs> and then when we said no, I think I don't quite remember what the guy said to you, but No, because like I said, thank you, but 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 no thank you, because I had a stutter. And then he made fun of your stutter, and then the second guy said something about how he was gonna He's gonna slap the fudge out of me because I called him a jerk. Yeah, so there was that's New York City for you. We certainly overheard a lot of um, a lot of weird people, a lot of s- interesting stuff. Uh, we we walked through Times Square two days in a row, <laughs> and each time got w- progressively weirder. Yeah, just every moment was a new surreal experience. Um, we saw like a breakup. We saw a guy like, with like doing his best uh, Death Leopard impression. Or- yeah, there was um, it was quite a mix. Do you want me to mention why we were in the city for two days? Instead yeah, why, why we were in there for two days? Because I felt like we spent more time on the train than actually in the city. We didn't, but it felt that way sometimes. Uh, so on Thursday, the day before the meetup, we went into the city because we had some fun interviews. Yes, and you'll be able to hear those. They'll be sprinkled throughout the episode. Yeah, do you want me to mention who we talked to? Yes. Yeah, so we spoke to Sarah Beth Pfeiffer, which you might know her as Clarice in the musical. She also plays a few other characters, including... Um, the Squirrel. The Squirrel, uh, infamously known uh, oh, henceforth wait, 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 as... Oh, well, yeah. I can't tell you what the name of the squirrel is. She'll, it's, she'll it's tell you. It's breaking news. It's breaking news. The squirrel has guys, a name. It's nuts. It's nuts. Um, and uh, we also spoke to, to Stephen Brackett, who is the director of the musical, talked a little bit about the logistics of what it's like to direct the show, how things have maybe changed since going on to Broadway, all of that stuff. So uh, those were some really interesting and exciting conversations. Um, so I, I guess we should sort of get into our thoughts on the musical itself. Yes. I think the first thing I want to say about this is that the theater we went to was very beautiful. The first thing I said to B was, look at that plaster line. Dang it, sexy. And it's weird because for living in California, we have so many earthquakes that a lot of the theaters that I go to, like the Pantages or uh, any local theater, doesn't have uh, three Tall levels. Tall ceiling. Yeah. It, it was very... It we wasn't that top, big, but top. it was very opulent, you know, a typical um, like New York Broadway theater, very, very beautiful moldings and things. It was funny because we went all the way to the top and it was just 
it was kind of crazy because I, like, I never looked down because I'm t- terribly afraid of heights. <laughs> yeah, there was a moment where we were on the steps where <laughs> Zach turns to me and goes, my fear of heights. And I thought he was joking. He's like, no, I'm really kind of afraid of heights. Well, no, I'm afraid of like being on like the balcony seat, but luckily we actually didn't have the seats. I just wanted to see what it looked like from the top. Yeah, we so actually- that was a... It was an interesting point of view. Um, it was kind of it was kind of surreal to be seeing the musical again after I already saw it. Like um, in in a lot of ways, it hasn't changed a lot. Like the the touring show and the Broadway show are like plot wise pretty similar, but you can just really tell that they've they worked on it and they have like everything really down to a science. Like they've they've got everything just right. Yeah, and when it came to me, this is the first time seeing the musical for me. I like musicals. Well, I guess I should preface by saying I like working on musicals. Musicals for me are sometimes hit or miss, but I have fun like working on them. And this was a musical that I really, really enjoyed. Uh, B saw me bop into the beat a couple of times. Yeah, what was the song that you got really into? Was it um, the Drive song? Yeah, Drive. Yeah, you were like just really singing along, um, just just singing and dancing. Like you were like (laughs) hitting into me like sort of bopping side to side you were really into yeah, it and what i liked about this this uh, musical was it was like concentrated essence of why i liked percy jackson i had the ratatouille moment where i ate the ratatouille and went back to back, <laughs> back to when you were a child yeah it's it's really funny because i didn't grow up with these books so i don't really have that like nostalgic association well i like i really like these characters now i care about these stories but it's just a different thing i don't think you can retroactively get that kind of affection for a story the way you can when you're like 12 years old and you're connecting to a character for the first time like i i understand that from the perspective of someone who really liked unfortunate events growing up it's like that same feeling um but even so as someone who's like relatively new to the fandom it was just really exciting i felt weirdly proud you know what i mean that this story has like traveled from being like a really small children's theater production to like being on tour and now it's on Broadway and all these people in the audience are all really obsessed with Camp Half-Blood and with Rick Riordan and all these stories like it was kind of surreal. Yeah, it's like the little Broadway show that could because it was off Broadway. Yeah, and then it had it went so on many a touring show and then it's back yeah. on Broadway, which is crazy because going from off Broadway to on Broadway, it's not unheard of, but it's one of those it's like you have like to a, really work at it. You have to yeah. work at it and also it's a really strong show that works in the theater environment that it had, though. The one thing that I really did enjoy about this was that it was a very small venue and the set was really well. It was like a black box set almost at times where it, it didn't was, have it that many setting changes. Back. Yeah. Um, that was like, do you want to talk a little bit about the negative reviews that some of the, the musical got? I mean, well, just the briefly, problem is, though, is that we're doing our own review. We shouldn't compare and contrast I, them. Just like the, the one thing I wanted to mention was some of the criticisms that the, the musical has gotten is that the um, the sets aren't too involved. But I feel like that that's, works. that's to the benefit of the, the story. It's pretty pared back. The, the props are sometimes really silly. You know what I mean? They'll have like sort of like this rolling cart that's made to look like a, a bus. bus. And it just has like, you know, lights strapped to it. And it's very minimalistic. So it's really your brain filling in, you know, the, the missing part. Yeah, that's where I was getting like the black box aesthetic because uh, there are some places where it's like, oh, this box is the truck or yeah, doing exactly. things like that. It's, it's me, like it mostly works. scaffolding and, and a few yeah, but I think key the, props. Yeah, I think it actually goes with the aesthetic of it's New York, and when you go into skyscrapers, like the Empire State Building, so to speak. Yeah, like I could scaffolding. see that. And then you had like a lot of the lighting, the natural lighting uh, that wasn't the LEDs or the PARs was those like construction lights that you yeah, would have. Yeah, the construction lights that they like mounted to things. So like, um, for instance, Aries has a, a motorcycle where it's just really a handle with a light on it, and like they're all piled on behind him and it's not it's not like an actual prop that looks like a motorcycle it's just him holding a it's hand just handlebars. It. but like it, it works for the effect your brain sort of fills in the gaps I well, also when it came choice. to that performance he was it made it look like they were on the motorcycle and you could yeah, really no, get they, into it i think it's because it it really speaks to the quality of the acting in a way that you're able to like go past the fact that you don't have a literal representation of a lot of the props but you can believe it because the actors believe it they're acting as if they're on a motorcycle they're acting as if there's like a giant minotaur and it's not just like a puppet that a few people are holding up you know what i mean even with the crazy puppets like the minotaur or even the furies those are a lot of fun because they have puppets and everyone knows i love puppets like when they had a little the choir came out yeah oh god yeah in in doa there's a moment where the um 
the the choir they're singing that, like had, the, that had died. Uh, Their voices will never change because they died when they were young. And they're just like, and I, I do think that is like an example of how how much this musical doesn't take itself too seriously. Like, oh, here are these really absurd sock puppets. They're not even, you know, like Muppet level puppets. No, they're, they're like literal they're like sock so- puppets. They're like socks with googly eyes and like squiggly hair. And you and know, that, I'm all hilarious. for that. Like, well, I know that that's like exactly where you live. Um, but yeah, I just, I think that there's like a lot of funny examples like that where they aren't trying to make you feel immersed in like a gritty grim dark interpretation no, of this is like the justice league movie this is i think with the negative reviews because i did read a couple of them uh today while you were sleeping and walking and uh i think a lot of the things is that if you're not prepared for like a ya environment because this is an adaptation of a ya book saying same as like be more chill and a lot of the other material and that you have to already kind of either be in that world or you have to be in the mindset which you're about to see is you something have to understand goofy. that genre i think if you go into the lightning thief expecting it to be one thing you're you might not like it if you ex- expect it to take itself very seriously or i mean but that that's the interesting thing about it though is it doesn't it also doesn't make everything a joke they do take their characters seriously well, there's, there's plenty of songs but we'll get to the songs that i think perfectly encapsulate every tone of percy jackson because there are really serious moments and there's really goofy moments i think the the funny thing though is while we we're watching it you know you're in Hades and then you go across the street and then there's Hades town and then yeah a couple like less than a block away is the cursed child, cursed child. yeah they're all sort of spiritually connected in this weird triangle so, of Greek mythology and YA literature it, it could also be when it came to those reviews people that they got they, probably they were weren't... expecting more of a Hades town thing yes. maybe yeah I, that's the thing is if you're expecting a musical that is maybe really serious all of the time or like trying to immerse you in a way that's like has like really magic awesome props is like or whatever. in Cursed Child or like in Hades Town. It's more of the environment and just how serious it could be. Whereas here, I forgot where I was for a moment and it was just one of those where you get to experience something that's fun and comedic and it's it captures I, the I tone. I felt like the, the musical was very character driven. I think that might have had to do with... Um, The perspective change, because if you think about the books, it's really from Percy's perspective. It's like a past tense Percy perspective. But with the musical, the way that musicals generally work is most of the songs are like sort of soliloquies or monologues or something. They're sort of internal statements about how people feel. Like the Greek chorus. Like I know, exactly. That goes back to like drama from forever ago yeah like that's that's the way that the drama always worked in a way but um that i think that's a a kind of interesting peek into these characters because a lot of like maybe the subtext that you would get from the books like implied like oh yeah clarice has hang-ups about her dad or you know annabeth really wants to prove herself and wants to you know get the attention of her godly parent and luke doesn't feel appreciated Yeah, exactly like all of those things are made a little bit more clear just because they get their whole their own song to be like here's how i feel about this and i i kind of really like that actually because you you get to like hear in their own words exactly how they feel. Um, And it feels very like in character, like they did a good job capturing that. Yes. And also I would agree with that, but also I would add to that is that the difference between a book and a musical is that you're using your mind's eye for a book. So what you think of is what the characters are doing and acting. Whereas when you see in live action, you have these actors that really know these characters, they can add like this nuance. Like there's a scene where Luke and Percy are sitting by the lake and that was like the moment where you realize like Luke can be evil, but you realize you can actually sympathize with him. He's- yeah, well, that that's like kind of the interesting thing about seeing it as like a play, a physical representation as opposed to your imagination. Is you can like ground that and like, oh, here's this real person who has all these complicated motivations. You know, he he has a reason for feeling alienated by his parents. He has a reason for maybe wanting and he to isn't help like Kronos a in a way. Weirdo. Yeah, I mean, he. I mean. We've talked about Luke. He is a weirdo, but he also has but a backstory. He's, he's complicated, exactly. Yeah, and they, they do a really good job of, like, getting that across, all that exposition, which really, you know, there aren't a lot of speaking lines, necessarily. It's it's a lot of just the musical and then, like, just subtle, even physical things of the way they act. So when it comes to this, like, a lot of musicals, you can either do, like, almost like the operatic or just almost all music or you have, like, the straight play aspects of it. Here, I think... What works about this is that there's a good synergy because this is the original cast. They know this inside and out. Before this, they did the uh, the school uh, visits, 
And when it came to this, I think everyone worked together to the point of where I believe that they're these characters, even if they're like yeah. they're aged up, and like you know they're obviously they're adults they're, playing they're this. Not, you forget yeah, about that girls. very very quickly. Yeah. Well, I mean, well later we're gonna when you listen to the Stephen Brackett interview, he talks a little bit about that how. You know, they understood, oh, well, they're younger in the books, but it's sort of a trade off. Like getting older actors, you get the benefit of, you know, people have to worry about yeah. like, oh, how many hours can we have these kids for yeah. a time? Like, there's when it comes to like getting kid actors, it's there's a lot of things, but also he was, I think, talking about experience. Yes. Like, all of these people are experienced musical theater people, they know what they're doing. And I think that that really benefits the story. How good they are at acting like let's be honest it's few and far between that you're going to get a 12 year old who has as much experience and dedication to like the theatrical arts like that's impossible a lot of the time because it's you're a child like you can only have so much experience exactly you can only log so many hours when you're that age so i understand why they made that decision and you know when you're watching the musical i personally don't really think about the the age thing because one they tried to kind of like avoid specifically saying what they're almost age like is. It's, like, it's just like not not the word androgynous but it's like almost it doesn't matter it's, it's like it's, it's like ambiguous or it's like ambiguous it's, thank you yeah it's like um you're you're meant to sort of understand that they're kids but it's not like that important that you believe that they're kids and it, that's not even like the most important aspect of their characters too because each actor i think understands like the emotional motivations of their character enough that I believe that um, Chris McCarroll is Percy, even though he doesn't look 12. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, he, no, like, he doesn't have, like, unless they wanted to get, like, a bunch of people like, like Peter Pan. Yeah, like, like a bunch that. of, like, really small children. Like, I, I still believe, I believe his, his motivations are Percy's motivations, you know? And it's it's kind of funny, actually. Chris McCarroll does a really good job of, um, like, embodying sort of, like, whiny teen voice. Did you notice that? Like, he's sort I of, I think like, he was more, like, I, I called him um, Sassiest Jackson at times because he can be really sassy, but then he has the... He nails the clueless parts when they're yeah, talking there's, about there's dumb things. there's something, I think, about the the character choice that he made. Um, it, it actually is, in some ways, too bad that we didn't get to speak with him because that would be really cool to sort of ask, like, his his sort of character in process. Yeah, because I, I don't think... He's not just doing his straight voice when he's doing the Percy character. He's doing like character. a mocking he's, tone. Well, he's, he does like a mocking tone, but there's sort of... um When he's talking to Anne about there's certain moments where he, like he has like a almost like a lisp, like he talks like a child. Like his mannerisms are very um like adolescent. He doesn't sound like an adult. And I think that that really works well in selling him as Percy. You know what I mean? It's not like this grown man being like, Annabeth, why would you do that? Like it... He doesn't talk like that, you know. And that, that's the yeah. moment Mar- I'm going in my Marty McFly. <laughs> You're mad- like, it's not unlike Marty McFly, you know. It's like this sort of like awkward teen who's a little bit like you. You believe that this is like a sort of, quote unquote like problem child. You believe that he's this kid who keeps getting kicked out of school and feels like really alienated and wants to like Im- impress his mom and doesn't want to let her down. Like all of these things are very believable as. Um, as Percy, I don't ever have this moment where I go, oh, well, this, this guy is just like in his 20s. Like, I didn't I didn't really get pulled out of it in that way. No, I really did enjoy his performance. And we'll get into the character stuff. But what I really enjoyed about it is I think when it comes to acting is that it's usually unless it's a one man play, it's it's a team piece. And I think what I really enjoyed about this was the synergy between everybody because everyone has like a breakout moment. And even when it comes to like the, I think the best example of this is like there are parts in this where you can't do everything, and they try to compensate that. Like with with Chiron, you can't have him in the whole horse body, which is something that, no, that that's we sort of to like talk the, the the minimalist set. It's like similar in that they they aren't trying to make you believe that Chiron is a centaur. They're not going to make a giant centaur. He just has costume. a horse tail. He just has a horse tail, and then he kind of has like horse yeah. movements that he does with his. No, feet. he does horse movements exactly. Um. Yeah, so Ryan Knowles is the guy who plays Chiron, and he does an amazing job kind of treading that line between absurdity like, absurdity and serious. Like, he's like the mentor character. He does really, he does a good job of, like, conveying that, but he's also kind of goofy. He puts on this deep, authoritative voice. Which is like, weird, Percy. because it's like, the second, like, I heard him talk for the first time, I, like, turned to you, like, that's the voice that's like, that, that shouldn't sound like it's coming out of his body, but then you kept hearing him talk. I'm like, yeah, this is really cool, because that's, Oh, because when you think of Chiron, you think of the Greek gods. You think of them with like bravado. Yeah, you think of. I them- actually feel like Ryan Knowles should get some special um, attention for his acting in this because he plays a lot of 
pretty important characters and See, he, does, he plays he plays chiron he plays hades he plays he's poseidon. poseidon yeah and, and he plays the guy that tells you to get on the tractor yeah and he plays um he plays Auntie M too oh he does play Auntie. yeah M. he does like a bunch of really great characters and i think they probably chose him for that because his voice acting is so great he does all sorts of really fun yeah, especially voice when he gets stuff. to hades it, that yeah, was no, like i was hades in tears. is like a very interesting choice right because you think oh he can get his voice to that really deep baritone so he can make it like really demonic he sounding but it, he chooses it's like a paul lind basically it's paul lind or it's it's not that i want to say it's flamboyant but it seems like yeah, something it's flamboyant. like he has a i mean he has a sequin jacket right it's sort of like person it's like sort of southern mixed with like a bit of like um like an up speak like he's very dramatic he's like i get lonely like there's something about his delivery that's really it's like a funny choice to me that i i thought was like much more interesting than say if he went out there and he just spoke in like a gravelly demonic voice it wouldn't and played have been it like cool that because then you'd have that problem of like comparing it to hercules in that sense of where Hades is almost like that but the joke is is that because he's in the he actually, has to entertain it's, it's pretty, himself it's pretty comparable to the the hades and hercules in some ways because he's he more is like he has a, a level of camp to him well, he yeah. doesn't take himself very dramatic. seriously he's like yeah he's dramatic he kind of does this these sort of like funny asides you know what i mean like one time he said oh like the trojans say don't look a gift a lightning bolt in the mouth you know what i mean he has like these little funny turns of phrase that make him feel like a very lived in character yeah i just like i feel like ryan knows he just like did so many funny voices that really like, i was i was in tears because there's parts like my favorite part of this musical is just a dumb thing that i love that they staged which was the cop on the tractor and they attached the wheelchair had, like little lights yeah on they it. attached the, the wheelchair from chiron to the weird wheeling no, it's, it's tray. scaffolding yeah the, the yeah the wheeling scaffolding and they're like this is the tractor and, and it was so funny because they they're obviously some all lights pushing on it. there so it's like it's so weird and minimalistic but it somehow works because they they know it's kind of goofy i think they understand how ridiculous that is but it but works you want that to happen and i feel like uh when it comes to it is that it's always the most important thing i've always stressed is the suspension of disbelief and you need that in this and it works here because you have that black box set where you can do things like the they do like the tree on the hill, which that scaffolding works because they use it in two tiers. But also here you have like the, the trains and you have all the craziness that I really enjoy about it is because it's almost it's grounded in this weird like you have to fill in the blanks. It's like a horror movie. The things that you don't see is scarier than what you do see. But the, yeah, the things that you don't see in this are like the adventure is in your own mind. Um, that's like really um, demonstrated in the song drive actually, because so much of that is a sort of montage. Like well, it's, no, it's, it's funny because you talk about how like it took us so long to get from point A to point B, but they do it in one song. No, It's just in one song. And that's like, they know that they're kind of being silly about that. There's like a tongue in cheek acknowledgement of them very quickly stopping in Las Vegas, seeing the Lotus hotel being like, Oh, don't go in there. Percy asking, ma'am, how long have you been here? Oh, my, my brother oh. and I arrived yesterday, yeah. May 1st, May 1939. 30, yeah, exactly. And then you realize, oh, wait a second, that's supposed to be Bianca, uh, Bianca D'Angelo, which obviously not everyone in the audience is going to get but that. You, it's tongue but, in cheek. Yeah, exactly. There's like a few like little references to things that if you're like a diehard fan, you're going to pick up on, um, which I think like speaks to how much the the writers and the cast care about the audience they care about the fans you know what i mean like making them feel somewhat included you know yes i think they do care about the fans but i think the problem though is you have that tricky balance between we'll get into it like adaptation is that how much can you be close to the fans but also not alienate people that have never heard of percy jackson before because uh we had some people that were there that was like oh the only reason why i'm here is because i had heard about that it was fun i don't know anything about percy jackson like there was things like uh, people were like trickling into the theater like for me I'm not to sound weird. I, I like to people watch and hear other people's conversations. So you were listening to like what people were talking yeah, about? Yeah, because I think the way to judge this, especially how we have to construct our review, is that we have to, we're fans, obviously, but we also have to think of it as for a first time watcher, does it work? Does it not work? Uh, how is it with adaptations? And there were a part, like I think they were doing that last song. I think it's like what, Bring on the Monsters, where I actually turned my head while they were doing like almost like closing and just looking at people. And like a lot of people were singing the songs. People were like, really wide-eyed and people like really focused and like no one like was not having a bad time they actually they were having a lot of fun watching and i think that's no, like, it was pretty engaging i'd say they well especially when you get like things like uh, how percy's water powers are like shooting toilet paper yeah again that's like another example of the the props and sets being just 
they lean more towards fun than realistic. Yeah. They're not trying to sell you on the fact that it's real water splashing on you. You know what I mean? Well, no, it reminded me of like the Blue Man group. It was they, a little bit, yeah. Like they had the audience participation, especially if you're sitting close to the front row where like the toilet the, paper I guess you would call flowing. that the, the splash zone. The splash zone. zone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's the toilet paper flowing. Or then there was one part. When did the confetti shoot? I don't remember. That was when, when they blew up the bus. Then they when they blew up the bus, yeah. And then they have like the side character. I think that was also Ryan Knowles actually who was just like, that's not even my worst experience on a Greyhound bus. Like the even, oh, no, I turned to you and was like, this is Sarah's nightmare. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, th- throwback to, to when Sarah was in an exploding bus. But yeah, there were so many just like little funny asides sometimes that like a side character would say that I just would crack up at. Like I, I there was like an acknowledgement that Percy Jackson, while it's, you know, it's YA, it's an adventure, it's a lot of different genres. It's also a comedy. It has a lot of comedy in it and well, it yes. stays true to that. And I think when it comes to it, I think this hits every mark of a Percy Jackson book. Because if you like boil down a Percy Jackson book, I don't know why. Please, guys, don't boil down your Percy Jackson books. Yeah, it's probably really just hard. Turn but into it, pulp. Yeah, but if you boil it down, there's three things. It's almost like Greek theater. You have the funny stuff, you have the coming of age stuff, but also you have the drama, which yeah, there's a lot of songs that hidden to that. And when it comes to the show, I feel like I think most songs hit. One, if not all three of those points. Well, yeah, no, I think there's well, there's yeah. specific songs that were made specifically to hit those points. Like Drive is obviously like when I think of Percy Jackson and the fun, crazy stuff. Yeah, that's that's, what that's more of. like the goofy stuff. Like that, I think that was their chance to be a little bit more not quite slapstick, but do you know what I mean? Like the the physical comedy was like really high in that. Yeah, and there's so, also like, there's like oh, there's like was yeah. it like hurricane level winds? We advise everyone don't, and then they go into Drive, just Drive. And like, the wind is blowing. Yeah, they're like. Yeah, that that was definitely more of like the sort of the goofy side of Percy Jackson. Then there's like the more... A tree on the hill is like, that's like the, the drama. Yeah, that's the drama. Exactly. The, the self-reflective like character songs. Like the thing about Tree on the Hill, which is really interesting, is that it's both a song about Talia, but it's also a song about Grover. So it's from his perspective. So you get... At first, he's sort of like the, the comedic relief for well, most of the Well, this is the, the part musical. where he's telling, yeah. like, almost like sw- singing a swan song or talking about like yeah, well, that, his biggest this is regret. Like, yeah, it's, it's like origin story, basically. So if you are new to the Percy Jackson universe, then you get to hear, oh, right, this is why he has all these insecurities about not being a good satyr. And, you know, he let Percy's mom die. And now he feels so terrible about this because he's thinking back to Talia and that, you know, if only he had been braver, if only he had been stronger and stayed behind and helped her and all of that stuff. Even um, with when it came to the blocking on that part i really enjoy that you had uh i guess to explain to people how they had it is that they're sitting in the scaffolding buses i'm going to call it and then up top not like a balcony but they had other yeah, scaffolding the, the, the scaffolding so, up, yeah. up higher was talia which and, is well no it was talia and abeth and and luke. Uh, and luke and i liked about this is that it, it told a story from the top and also told a story yeah. in the bottom like i had like the like yeah. the, almost it was like, like the a shits. split screen yeah it was a split screen uh, yeah, it was like a split screen, but I was thinking I have like the Shih Tzu eyes where I had to put like one up and what one down because I, <laughs> I was like yeah. trying to watch both of them because one you have like the Talia stuff and that was a fun little blocking and then you had the stuff on the bottom where yeah, so it was like uh, it was um, Grover emoting about what happened and yeah. then above him is happening the actual like, event the actual event like a sort of flashback and they're acting in slow motion so there's um so talia is also played by sarah beth pfeiffer yes. um and she's standing there she's dressed obviously slightly different than her clarice outfit sort of like emoting like doing the like fighting back the monsters and it, like pantomiming yeah fighting back the monsters and it's like in slow motion with luke and annabeth trying and to you get the back. whole backstory and i think it, it's something that will i feel like well let's get into the characters because I think that's the most important thing when it comes to any play is uh, the performances. And I find that everybody, I think we touched upon this, is that there's some great synergy. But I think the three leads, plus everyone else, because this was a very, very yeah, small well, the three, crew. The three leads, and I would say, um, we are, I guess we already gave a shout out to, to Sarah Beth and also Ryan. Well, yeah, but they, I'm saying it's like we have they the were three. were both great. <laughs> we have like the people that I guess had the most uh, theater time or yeah. on stage presence. But also, yeah, this was a very, very small cast, so everyone's pulling like, multiple. Yeah, they're hats. they're playing multiple characters, which is which works to their benefit. We were talking about this off mic, actually. How, like, for instance, there's a moment where Percy has a dream sequence, and he sees someone, the lightning thief, presumed yes. to be, and talking Kronos. to talking to Kronos, 
And you know that this is the same voice as Luke, right? You know that this is... Uh, so James Hayden Rodriguez, Rodriguez played Luke and a few other characters. Yeah. So He's also Ares. Could, he's, but he's also Ares. He's also a few other characters. So immediately you don't go, oh, well, clearly it's Luke who's the Obviously lightning that's thief. Obviously the voice. Like, that's kind of the problem of going back yeah. to like a, like a live action movie. Right. Even you have would like have li- to conceal their voice or something because once you know what they sound like... You it's know the very twist. Di- exactly. So I think it actually really works to their benefit for stuff like that because he's wrapped in a cloak or whatever. You hear his voice and you're like, well, yeah, that could be Luke. That could be Ares. In some ways, it's It could both. be a new character. It could be another character played by him. Yeah, exactly. He plays all sorts of side characters throughout the show, It's funny. I think there was, like a, there was a tweet from the Lightning Thief. It was like one of like one of the first performances. Like The high that we chase is like the one time the person gasped when they found out who the Lightning Thief really was. <laughs> and it's funny because you have things like this. And I think when it comes to the whole cast, they're all pulling a lot of hats. Like there, I don't think there was a running crew. I think... The ASM helped with one bit of it, but everyone was giving it their all. And it's crazy because there's so many different uh, casts of people. Like you have the person who plays Selena, also plays Percy's mom, and then plays, I'm going to say, Chiron? Wait, who? The ferry yeah. boat driver. Oh, uh, Chiron? Chiron. Yeah, Chiron. This is the one is, where yeah. I had a problem with, with Chiron yeah. and Chiron. Yeah, no, you have the same problem that Percy did. Yeah, yeah Car- she's also yeah Caron, and she sings like the and the she's DOA also the oracle. Song. Yeah, she- exactly the oracle. Those are some really great musical numbers. The oracle song. Um, God, what is the name of that? Is that just called the oracle? I yeah, it's called the like oracle. It's called the oracle. But um, then you have like that's DOA. A- can I just talk about the costuming of that? That was so cool. Yes, she no- has the long dress, and then underneath are all the different hands. characters with their hands moving. Well, it's so supposed to be like, like, kind of like, yeah, creepy because yeah, like a creepy it, nebulous ghost or something. It, and then all of a sudden, and also she with like the spooky down. like yeah. Jamaican accents, I think that it adds more to it. And I love like then then you get to like DOA. Like I was listening to it. The song doesn't actually work if you're listening to it. You actually have to experience it because they talk about like Kurt Cobain. There's it's, a lot of sight gags, I sight think, gags, because yeah. you have, you see um, Kurt yeah, Cobain. Yeah, same guy who plays uh, Luke. He pops in for a second, and he's James Brown. And then you see you see Kurt Cobain. You see Janis Joplin. You see um, Bach? who's the third person? Oh, you know it was a uh, Mozart? Mozart. Yeah, Mozart. It's Mozart. And so there's just like all these people doing quick costume changes, popping in and out, and like it it works definitely more on the stage, I think, than when you're listening to it. Especially when it comes to like one of my favorite scenes is the part where they're lost in the woods in New Jersey and they have the squirrel, which any other time it would just be ridiculous to have uh, actors sitting just looking at a squirrel. But the way it's like staged. Hold on. I forget this, this character's name. Um, Who's the character who's obsessed with trees in the beginning? That was just, an, I think, a new character? No, no. That was in the original. That was, it was, it was one of, because she's like the, the daughter. She, a daughter of, of Demeter. Of Demeter. So she's obsessed with trees. But she... Sarah Beth Pfeiffer is in the costume yes. as that character while the squirrel is talking. So that's kind of like a funny reference to like she's related to nature and then the, she's doing like funny little squirrel voice. And I guess that's they chose that. I mean, we could you'll hear in the interview um, that, you know, they, they made that sort of pragmatic decision that for whatever reason, a squirrel was funnier than a poodle in that scenario. I don't. I think it no, works really well. No, I think really the well. perfect. I think it. Yeah, I think it works just as well. And then it brings um, the tickets. Yeah. No. And then it's like Amtrak tickets, and it's just like Grover popping out. Um. I thought that um, that Joral. So Joral Javier. He's the guy who plays Grover. Grover. He does. He does like a pitch perfect job of being like a little bit cowardly, a little bit goofy, like a good and best a good friend. friend. Yeah. Exactly. Like, there's he, that. There's that hard balance of like confidence, but also. Like there's like the weird strange line of like you can be cowardly but also almost like a, it's like a camp factor where like you can either like take it to the extreme yeah, but no, the he's way not, he has is just it's almost like the three little bears it's just right No he's not like you know absurdly cowardly or anything he he gets a little nervous but like also you understand that he He's there to help Percy. I I don't know. I liked his acting in that. And then when he just like the little funny moments of like comedic relief when he's just like, oh well, Luke got away, but I'll get all the squirrels in the eastern yeah, so seaboard to go look, look for, him. for him. Yeah. And then there's when then he also plays Dionysus, which I like as Dionysus. Oh it's yeah, so that's, great. that's really great with the gruff voice and with the, with the gruff yeah. voice. And he's like he's cranked it up to like fourteen. Yeah. So his his song is another terrible day, and that um yeah that's. It's perfect. Yeah, it's perfect. That's kind I of exactly. I think if I want to think about what Dionysus is, it's like that's like the tone you should have because he's always like mad and angry, and he's like there's even a part says like I'm why are you asking me for advice? I'm the god of alcohol. Yeah, that's um that's like a great 
great exposition for like all the the camp culture like they bring in different campers you know what i for mean the it's problems. Like, for, for the different problems that they're asking him to solve and that what gives was you the like the first a, was like selena beauregard yeah and talking she's talking about Char- charlie beckendorf. beckendorf and she's like oh well i was kissing oh, I was him holding hands with him yeah, and whatever. then like he started growing, and then she started growing uh, sunflowers, flowers everywhere, everywhere. And then, she, then he's like she, he's holding hands with a nymph like all these I don't know. You get like a, a whole lot of context about what the camp is like just from that little song that he does. Um, I guess that's that's really maybe the mark of a successful musical to some extent is within these the limitations of a song. You have to get a lot of cross. Well, there's a lot of it beats too, to it. And I feel like when it comes to all the staging, especially once again, going back to people are playing multiple hats, it's almost... It, it's interesting because there's such a different range because you have such a small cast of people have to do like crazy rock and roll songs and then cut to like disco yeah the genres are are interesting they they work for what scenes they're doing i find that most of percy's songs are like i guess rock no they're like indie rock yeah whereas like i think i'll put you in your place to clear this song is more like it's more like hair metal or something no it's not even hair metal it's more like like joan jet it's like oh yeah it has that too yeah Yeah. i guess it's called like girl grunge i think yeah like like, like, no that's a little bit later i think yeah it's more like like 80s power ballad or something like that yeah that's kind of the put you in your in your place is definitely and they did something like i really liked was that when aries comes out and they have their fight they're doing he's doing the exact same song as her when they're fighting on the yeah, beach yeah yeah i like the the that's the parallels i i like that in a musical where musical motifs reappear in a different context and that was like a good use of it like oh they're connected through the fact that she's the daughter of aries and they might have similar dispositions so he's like i'll oh, put your new place like that's where clarice learned that from you know what i mean they're yeah. showing like the connection even though she like really doesn't see him that much but yeah, and there's even like a line about the like that's like her, i think they're like one of her last lines like oh did did you talk about me yeah yeah that's what we were um we were talking about with with sarah beth how you know the the experience of trying to bring clarice to life as a character and it's it's difficult because she can get a little bit exaggerated she's always gruff and like the aggressive problem though is, like, to I people. Get, we'll, we'll probably get into the interview actually let's go into the interview right now because it's a really good interview and when we get back we can kind of talk, talk about, about clarice. A little more. yeah so check right back in Good morning, campers, and welcome to Radio Camp Half-Blood, a Percy Jackson read-along podcast. I'm B, And I'm Zach. And this week, we have a very special guest, uh, Sarah Beth Pfeiffer, also known as Clarice from the Lightning Thief musical. Hi, guys. We got How's some very powerful energy in this room right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The one and only daughter of Aries. Indeed. Among others. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but the one and only Clarice. Oh, definitely. Yes. Mm-hmm. The one that shows people in the toilets and calls everyone losers. We, we love it. Indeed. Um, so I guess that kind of leads into one of our questions, which is, what do you like best about playing Clarice? I mean, it's so funny. As an actor, a lot of times, you know, you do a lot of prep work. You think a lot about, like, your backstory and stuff. Um, and, of course, I did all of that for Clarice, but she's kind of a character that just, like, inhabits your body in a very visceral way. Yeah, she could be very in-your-face. She's very in-your-face. She's, you know, she's working from a, out of a lot of anger, you know. Um, it's funny, yeah. Like, I like to say backstage sometimes, like, I have to, like, Sarah Beth has to stay, like, at least 25% in control because if Clarice takes 100% control, then things get a little dangerous, you yeah, know. Yeah, people go flying. <laughs> and you you don't want to mess it act that too much no, I think totally um, yeah but like that's the funny thing about Clarice though is in some ways she does have like the front of being aggressive but there is like the softness oh my gosh. character too totally yeah I mean and it's like she sort of just makes a couple very key appearances in the show but I love this is where we were just chatting before we got on mic about how awesome our writers are Robert Kiki and Joe Trace and you know the fact that Joe Trace in one line manages to sort of get in Clarice's softer side at the end of the musical, I don't think this is a spoiler. No, no. <laughs> uh, there's a moment when Annabeth says, we met your dad. And Clarice goes, you met my dad? Did he mention me? <laughs> like, And that sort of shows you, you know, her whole her whole thing. 
Yeah, yeah, the characterization in the musical is so great because just in like a few lines, they really just get exactly the character. Yes, especially when it comes to like the musical, you have so much less time to work with than a book, which is you can fully flesh things out. And that's kind of the brilliance, especially when it comes to Clarius, is that in the book, she's like this really in your face person. But throughout the series, you you get to know her in a much more softer way. Totally. Yeah, um, I guess that kind of also leads into... Oops, sorry. <laughs> Leads into what we we're going to ask about how you like prepared for the role. Like, did you read the books? Like, how much context did you have? Yeah, definitely read the books. Um, it was many years ago now because I've been actually working on the show for five years. Right. Were you part of like the really small production? Thing? Yes, I was. I did the very first workshop of the hour long version of the show. Um, and yeah, it's very rare in the world of theater that you get brought along this far with a show. So it's it's incredibly special to sort of have had this long, epic journey with the show and to now actually be, you know, making my Broadway debut in a piece that means so much to me. Yes. That's such a that must be such a, like a wonderful feeling. It's like going to Disney World for the first time. Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean and Clarice yeah, has all grown up. <laughs> it's true. Oh my gosh. Well and I've been in, you know, other well, when they were developing the so the story of the musical which you may or may not know is that it started out as like an hour long children's theater piece. Yeah. And yes. then it was so popular and the bones of it were sort of so strong that the producers um, decided to expand it into this uh, now full two act, totally, you know, family friendly, but, you know, good for kids and adults of all ages uh, version. And so, you know, when they were expanding it, they tried a lot of different stuff, including um, Rob wrote a song called Pick a Side, in which... Um, Clarice like is back at camp and sort of like having to fight off all these monsters at camp because you know like things are starting to get, up. get a little hairy yeah uh and it is funny I will say I mean as as much you know context as reading the full series gives you on Clarice in terms of like how I play her in the show having more than like a sentence at a time to say as Clarice like it, it it didn't like fully work <laughs> it's like is it just like too much I guess yeah I don't know it would have required certainly sort of like for me to step back and rethink some things because like for her to be uh more verbal more thoughtful about things it's like I'm I'm kind of just running with the idea of like <sighs> like as the general context for uh for most of the things that she does in the show. Especially with like all the songs that you have, because I think uh, Joe said that you came up with something called Squelching or something. Oh, that's... Battle Squelting. Uh, ba thank you. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, because Clarice's big song is called Put You in Your Place. And so, yeah. So along with character development, I also make really good friends with the treadmill and uh, the weight room at my gym in preparation for the show, for sure. You send them Christmas cards. Yeah, definitely. They're close, close friends because in order to, you know, keep stay healthy and and do everything that's required of me in that song, which is sing really, really high as well as run around, wield two swords and, you know, generally kind of kick Percy's butt. Uh, you definitely need to be in, in good shape. Especially when it comes to that with a lot of uh, the musicals, very physical from what I've heard. Especially you're, you're singing, you're dancing, but you're also kicking butt at the same time. Oh, how, yeah. how, how, can you talk us a little bit about that process? Yeah, I mean, it's really cool. Um, we have a fight director named Rod Kinter. He's awesome. He's genius. Um, and, you know, they made me custom made double swords, which is pretty dope. You know, I had some stage combat experience, but a lot of it we just kind of had to pick up as we went. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's a huge, cool part of the show that I feel like you don't get in a lot of musicals. Yes. Yeah. Do you find that at the end of the show, you're just like completely exhausted? <laughs> I mean, it's amazing how when you do something eight times a week, it sort of like turns into a sort of neutral. But at the same time, yeah, I mean, like uh, we get physical therapy as a part of sort of our regimen with the show and it's very it's very necessary you got to take you got to take care of yourself especially when it comes to like fighting or you probably have had like oopsie days where you've smacked each other in the face yeah you know we we've we've had a minimum of those but i won't say that they haven't ever happened 
there was one time on tour when I uh, accidentally stabbed Chris McCarroll. <laughs> well, you were the one that stabbed him. I've heard like people on social media talk about this. Yes, it was me. It was me. It's amazing how, you know, you can do something hundreds of times, but if like the smallest thing is out of place. Well, and in my defense, again, I have two swords. <laughs> <laughs> Dual wielding. So if you're in control of one of them, you also have to be thinking about where the other one is. And yeah, it got a little funky one night and he was fine, but he did get stabbed. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask, um, aside from Clarice, what your favorite character in The Lightning Thief was. Oh, man. I mean, this is, I hope this isn't sacrilege because he's not in the books, but um, I am pretty fond of my squirrel. Oh. oh. Squirrel. Yeah, I mean, for, for whatever reason, Robert Kiki decided that a squirrel was going to play better than a poodle would. <laughs> Um, so yeah, one day he just walked into one of the workshops of the expanded version and said, do anyone anyone have an idea for like a squirrel voice? And I was like, "Mm, I mean, I could, I could toss something out there. And now that squirrel's on Broadway. Yes. And I've heard many people talk about it. (laughs) I think there's actually like a little fan page on like one of the wikis about like the squirrel, where it came from. Yeah. Just about the squirrel. Well, I mean, exclusive, exclusive, um, I've named the squirrel his name is terrence terrence, terrence. Mm-hmm. terrence the and there's a i wrote a little theme song for him it goes terrence terrence he's a very good squirrel <laughs> so that's there's a little exclusive that's really good the squirrel fans that's great out there. that's um my new ringtone there you go yeah, <laughs> yeah no problem happy to happy to do it <laughs> so when it comes to, like the lightning thief there's been, always been like a huge amount of fans and people love the show what has been your favorite fan interaction of someone? Has someone like dressed up in full Clary's war armor and brought like a boar's head? I mean, not quite that far. Um, but I mean, it's always so gratifying. Like the fact that we have this fan base built in and that people have such a strong, awesome relationship with these characters. That's and it, our show to some yeah, extent too. Yeah. It means it me well and so and we're performing live every night, right? And so like you want great feedback from your audience and it's there a hundred percent of the time because we always have like half bloods in the audience, you know, who You see all those orange shirts and you're yes. just like, Oh man, let's get it on. Absolutely. Amazing, amazing. Um and then I I will also say like on a slightly more serious note, um, you know, I'm like proudly queer and um getting to, you know, with social media these days you know, there's the fans follow us and just the, the feeling of just being authentically myself and having that be like an inspiration to people that helps other people live their more true lives. You know, that's just a huge, crazy, awesome bonus that just sort of comes along with, with having this fan base. Yeah. Yeah. That's like the best fandom in the world, basically. (laughs) Totally. Oh my gosh. It's like the most inclusive. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when it comes to Rick Ryden, like uh, he adds more things and he has like non-binary characters. He has trans characters. Totally. He has uh, queer people. He's got um, people of color. It's yeah. one of yeah. the best people, things I mean, about the show. all the characters have disabilities to some extent. Yeah. So. That's like sort of the theme, right? Yeah. The things that make you different are the things that make you strong. Um, what made you want to become an actor? I've been into it, you know, since I was a wee young thing. I just got bitten by the bug. I've always been singing, I think, since I could talk and... Um, I mean, it was really, I think when I was like a freshman in high school, you know, I'd had a really, really rough go of it in middle school. I think we've all had like uh, a really yeah. rough go. If you I had mean, a good time in middle school, I'm suspicious. I of don't you. trust you at all. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. You probably think Sprite is spicy at this point. <laughs> yes. You're well a very put. boring person. Well put. Um, so yeah. So, you know, I had the typically rough time in middle school and then my freshman year fall I got cast in the musical and it was just this crazy sigh of relief the community that came along with being in that show was the most wonderful thing I had ever felt I have always worked in theater as well it's that crew your cast is your family a hundred percent yeah and so I think I've just been I mean my favorite thing obviously I love you know the sort of artistry of it all and making the art but the people that come along with doing theater is the best i think it's the i've been chasing that feeling ever since that's always been a wonderful feeling now do you have any advice for people that probably want to get into like musicals or theater because a lot of people they think about it but sometimes what would be intimidating yeah. yeah yeah totally i mean you know my biggest piece of advice is just find a way to be creative and do your thing every day 
because I think in in theater and like, you know, acting, it can feel like you need someone else's permission or like be cast in something by someone else in order to like do your art. But if you're really an artist, then I think you need to be like feeling a passion and a drive that isn't waiting for anyone else to give you permission. And, you know, I mean, we all have like a little movie studio in our pockets these days. Right. So you can be putting yourself out there and just making stuff, find people. I mean, I love theater because it's a collaboration, right? And so just find the people that, you know, speak your language that you want to collaborate with and make stuff. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Really, it's been really great. appreciate awesome it. Awesome meeting you. I'm Zach. I'm B. I'm Sarah Beth. And let's keep staying mortal. Bye, guys. See ya. So, guys, we're back. That was a really fun little interview. Yeah, that was, it was great talking to, to Sarah Beth. She had a lot of really fun insight and interesting things to say about what it was like to play Clarice and a few other characters, yes. like Terrence the Squirrel. Terrence the Squirrel, I love, and her little who has, song. Who has a little theme song. Yes, yeah. and that's wonderful. But I think when it comes to like her performance is that uh, when it comes to like Clarice, you can either be like, uh, there's like a delicate balance between being over the top, just screaming and yelling all yeah, the time. Yeah, which you, in su- to some extent, that is her because she's... In the sh- like actual text, she's playing that character. She's well, in the you know text. I mean? She's like she's over putting the on top. that. She's putting on that persona, so y- she is that way. But also, you have to understand. I mean, we were talking about this when we talked about the demigod files. A lot of what her character is is like having that shell bravado of, yeah exactly having the shell of aggression because inside she feels really insecure about it's the it. buttercup yeah, effect exactly she wants to impress her dad she wants to make him proud and like a lot of demigods have this sort of complex and i think it manifests in different ways but that's how it, it manifests in clarice and i you know sarah beth mentions that just like that one line of like when they they mention seeing Ares and she goes you saw my dad did he mention me like just like that little moment is enough to like give you an understanding of how she feels about him. You know what I mean? Like that's, yeah, it was really yeah, good. I thought like it was a like, good characterization. Yeah, especially when it came to like the fight scenes and stuff, and like she's like fighting with the two swords and all the fun little fight scenes. I think were really well choreographed, and it's crazy because when it comes to like choreographing things, things can go wrong very quickly. But because they, I think uh after the show robert kiki was telling asking us questions we were doing a little q a because we had to go backstage and he was telling us to do like yeah that was, 30 do, minute fight do you want to do you want to talk about that a little bit or we'll, do, we'll talk we'll about, about later, we'll get that yeah. to the end yeah uh but it, it's crazy because yeah they're always active there's always something happening it isn't just like a straight play where they're just sitting or standing and just yeah, doing dialogue. They need to simultaneously get across. They have to get character exposition and also be singing and also be sword fighting. It's so like basically, a lot. you know what this is? It's just ADHD. Oh, it's true. Yeah, it's like multitasking, really. Um, yeah, there's just so much going on. And it's actually, it's like pretty impressive that they're able to successfully convey all of those things at the same time. I mean, even like you said, we we spoke to Rob a little bit after the show and him like talking about all of the lighting cues yeah, and everything. Yeah, so we'll get into because yeah. I feel like this is where I, I can I can shine about this but uh when it came to like actually let's just get into like the lighting and stuff because the the set is minimalist but all the lighting they had they had a lot of smart lights they had a bunch I of i think parts. that that really um helps the effect of the well, no, minimalist there's, a, there's a great scene where like yeah. so on like the scaffolding they had like little led strips and there's a part where they're going down to the elevator to Hades. And, and it's, it's like, like flashing, so it gives you the sense of motion. motion. Yeah, yeah, or when they're in Hades, it's sort of like moving in a way. And it's also depending on what the, the tone of flames, is. Like that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah, and also when it comes to like the tree on the hill, like they light up and it makes a tree. Like there's some great things. I was expecting, there, there were like um, a lot, of, not a lot of digital projections or cookies, uh, but when it came to it, I feel like the lighting designer really, really did shine because there's a lot of blues. Obviously when you're in Hades, there's a lot of reds. And that I think it's because of the minimal, minimalist set it, that has like a place to shine in a way that you're able to sort of like fill in the blanks with some of the lighting. Like even the moment where Luke and Percy are talking on the side of the lake and the and lake like is the just, it's just light, a blue a spotlight light. that's yeah. sort of like shimmering like the lake. And that's enough to give you the impression that they're at yes, a lakeside. Yes, because you know? once we, we're trying to not compare it to like a, like a live action movie because you can't compare it that way. But it goes back to the idea of suspension of disbelief. Like one of my favorite ones is uh, right in, during the second act, like the beginning once the house lights go down is you're getting blinded by the two lights because it's yeah. the bus and it's already the whole adventure's already started. And that's I think that's what I turned to. Like, oh my God, it's Sarah's worst nightmare. Yeah, no, exactly. Like there's, they, they'll, they'll immerse you 
in a sensory way if they can't immerse you with like literal meticulous props you know what i mean they don't recreate the entirety of the st louis arch you can't you do know that what I mean? you that physically just, can't it would do not that. be practical to try to represent all of the different settings especially like when to. we went backstage like this this backstage is not that big no it's so you not can't, yeah you can't where would things... you store that stuff? well no and i think it works that they're, it's so minimalist in that way and i think they use that space so well like there's like on the sides i think on stage stage left they have like um like a fridge and all that stuff for the for the gabe stuff but then they also have other crazy things like paint cans and people like running up and down the scaffolding it's it's crazy to have the amount of stuff that they have and i i believe that was at camp half play i think that's what i was getting like when, when they were doing drive is that i sat back and realized this is why i like percy jackson is because it's fun it has some some great energy but also you don't have to like overcomplicate things which yeah i think that's yeah. what helps with the they, show they don't overcomplicate things i think that if you especially honestly i'm not to like downplay that there are people who you know maybe not maybe haven't read these books and they went to go see them i'm sure that they would enjoy the musical too but if you have an investment in these characters in this world you know this you, is in good hands yeah you if you come to see the musical it feels genuine it feels like it's it's speaking the same language as the books you no know joke I mean? like i had the ratatouille moment where they're doing drive and the cop on the tractor and i realized like i had like going back to like, the first time i read this like my grandma got me the books and it, I actually started crying. So before we get into the music, uh, we actually have a very special interview with Stephen Brackett, who was the director of the Lightning Thief musical, and he has a lot of fun things to say. So check it out. Good morning, campers, and welcome to Radio Camp Half-Blood, a Percy Jackson read-along podcast. I'm B, And I'm Zach. And this week we have another special guest, uh, Stephen Brackett, the director of the Lightning Thief musical on Broadway. Hi, everybody. Hi. How are you doing today, Steven? I'm good. I'm good. We just opened last night, so everybody's How really excited. How was the opening? Yeah, it was really great. It was That's really wonderful. Great. Yeah, it was oh, a, a chance to celebrate with everybody is always pretty amazing. It's probably so. the best feeling in the world on opening night once you get it done. It's like it's all going to be much easier for yeah, me. <laughs> yeah, totally. It was filled with like family and friends and a bunch of uh, fans, and so it was a really, really celebratory night. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, we just, we just spoke to Sarah Beth as we were talking about off mic, and um, she was just saying that everyone's a little bit <laughs> tired from yeah. the opening night. Yeah, it's a crazy amount of energy, yeah. right? And so, yeah, I think everybody has like an opening night yeah. hangover, even if they weren't <laughs> drinking or anything. Yeah. So we, um, we were just talking actually about uh, Joe Trace, yeah. who uh, wrote the play. Yeah. And um, you worked actually on his other musical, Be More Chill. So we, I guess we wanted to talk about like the differences maybe of working on those two musicals. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I've known Joe for a while. He and I met at a theater here in New York called um, Ars Nova. And so I uh, directed a short play of his that was like sort of about like Nintendo Mario Brothers. And so <laughs> like I've always known Joe to be like a really amazing fan of um, all sorts of different things, right? And so um, that has led him really um, uh, to be an amazing adapter because he really understands. He gets the material and then he like, for, uh, we've met Joe many times. Like he like, if, if you could like jump into a book, that's Joe. That's yeah. Joe. Well, yeah, totally. I, it's funny. I was just talking about how our careers are kind of parallel because he was also on my other podcast, um, Unfortunate Associates, which is about um, unfortunate events because yeah. he wrote, wrote on the Netflix show. So yeah. it's like very similar kind of lives that we've lived. Yeah. <laughs> so, very different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, he's he's yeah. carved out a really amazing space for himself as somebody who really understands adaptation and understands translation, be it for TV or for stage. Because right. yeah, Beamer Chill is also YA, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and both of the projects were my... In introductions to the different material right so i read ned vizzini's book going into be more chill and i read percy jackson for the first time uh going into pitch for this uh project um uh, and i knew i was in good hands with both of them with joe because i understood how how much he really kind of geeked out over the material and especially when it comes like he set the bedrock down then you get to be the person that gets to play with the toys yeah 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 totally totally and he's a really great collaborator too like when something's not working will be like oh is it the staging that sucks or is it the scene or what you know like what what do we have to fix and so um, there's a really nice kind of close relationship there so that we can kind of figure that out without a ton of ego involved which is really amazing yeah that's that's super amazing now when it comes to the lightning thief we've had such a huge body of characters 
What has been your favorite scene to actually direct? They're all really fun. We started off with a one-hour version and then went for yes. t- a two-hour version. And I think for the fir- one-hour version, the opening sequence was one of my favorites to stage. Just like going through the museum and meeting a fury and getting that kind of adventure in there was really um sort of exciting and, and pretty thrilling. Um, but I really lo- have loved also um, Staging Tree on the Hill with the, the Talia backstory and kind of figuring out how to represent that in a way that is exciting but also has some poetry to it. Yeah, so when we spoke with Sarah Beth, we talked a little bit about sort of the fight choreography and yeah. all the different sort of props and things. Yeah. What are like the unique challenges of something like The Lightning Thief? Like, Well, I think that there's a bunch, right? And we knew that from the get-go that we were going to be embracing limitation with this right, right. that we knew that you can't the, have like a 80 foot minotaur you can't <laughs> you have can't. totally flying. totally totally yeah, or you'll be spider-man turn off the door yeah exactly <laughs> exactly well and also i was thinking a lot about um my relationship to reading the book right and the book is so evocative and i didn't want to rob an audience of their own imagination of the world, yes. right? And so I wanted to kind of fill in the blanks, giving them some things to suggest um, where we are and who we're looking at, but allow the audience to kind of create the spectacle along with us, right? Yes, and that's the most important thing is the suspension of disbelief, but also the most important thing, even in horror movies, it's cooler to see not see things than it is to see things. Totally. Yeah. Like, totally. I mean, the, the water effects, right, are just sort of like these toilet paper guns, and I feel like that's just fun in the way it it doesn't really take itself too seriously totally totally in the way that it feels like that's similar to the vibe in the book yeah yeah exactly you know and that that we didn't want everything to be sort of um just superfluous we wanted it to have heart and to have stakes right and so we tried to make the fights as dangerous as possible but it's always that kind of balance of uh, making sure that the actors are really playing the scene but also then having some fun with it as well yeah, especially when it comes to having fun with the the show, is that it, with, with the being in theater and not having a a movie at it. We're not trying to talk about the movie, but having <laughs> no you know how like, it could that. be like a continuous <laughs> art form. Yeah. Uh, what have been some of the, uh, the interesting moments where either someone's had to improv something because something wasn't there, or what have been some of the I like to call them oopsie daisies on stage? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Staging the campfire song was really fun in a way that um, I knew that I wanted that section to be kind of raucous and to have like some ad libs in there and to have it really feel like that feeling when you're surrounded by people that you've just met that but you're already starting to feel really connected to right I have really amazing camp memories right Um, uh, and so that was a section where we had a little bit of a structure but we let the actors really just kind of riff and vibe and we talked about that um, YouTube video of that girl crying when she's dancing in her little lamb outfit (laughs) you know and like and so like it was definitely that type of a room where we we allowed for there to be some flexibility in the room for like stupid references to come up and that's where Jarrell's little dance comes from when he's singing his verse there's like a little tiny section where he's moving his paws back and forth and that just all came off of us like geeking out over that amazing video when it comes to the lightning thief you're dealing with like kids but because of the show it has more of adult feel uh, was there any challenges with trying to make uh, you know adults or at least people in their 20s appear more as like teenagers? Is there any challenge with that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it it's it's a tricky thing to figure out how to how to adapt that. Right. We knew that we wanted really strong, amazing, gifted musical theater performers that definitely aged us up from the sixth grade demographic, right? I mean, we made a conscious choice not to cast kids in those parts, right? Because we wanted all of the benefits of what comes with casting a Chris McCarroll or or a Sarah Beth or, you know, any of these amazing, amazing talent people. But we also wanted to make sure that we didn't age them up too much, that we didn't want to, like, make sexy Percy Jackson. You know what I'm saying? Something that we we talk about a lot on our show is that one of the main messages, he hates that. (laughs) But also I love, there was a quote from an interview a while ago that the most important thing about the show is the friendship, not the romance. Yeah, totally. Totally. We've got a couple cheats in there like we never actually address their ages in the show right um for a little while we had an, an, a reference to the sixth grade in there and we took that out right and so and it, it that kind of goes along with that idea of suspension of disbelief whatever you want to believe 
in terms of their age, you're allowed to believe that, right? So if you really want to try to say, I'm going to suspend my disbelief and imagine that they are really in the sixth grade, good for you, go at it, right? But I think the rest of us maybe think of them more, just a little bit more grown up, but not really getting into weird territory. Well, that also goes back to the idea of a suspension of disbelief because you can revert them back to like that age and you don't have to really think about it at yeah. times, Yeah, which can be a very important thing. So... We were just talking about how you debuted on Broadway mm -hmm. last night, which is amazing. Um, I actually saw you guys when you were still touring. Oh, um, cool. So how Where? has... Yeah, I saw it. Oh, um, God, now I can't remember this. <laughs> no worries. It was in New yeah. York. Yeah, it was in New York. Oh, the Beacon. Yeah, the Beacon. There great. we go. Yeah. Cool. It was great. It was. It felt very fitting, too. The, I felt like the, the Grecian vibes yeah. of the theater really went with it. Yeah, um, totally. So how has the musical changed at all since you've gone to Broadway? The Broadway production is really similar to what the tour was, what the national two-act tour was. We made a couple little tweaks, a couple little, we tightened a couple little things um, uh, and had some rehearsals with the actors to just kind of brush up everything. But it, it, it basically is, is the tour version just on a Broadway stage. We had a little time to kind of finesse and kind of make sure that the scale of the performances matched the theater itself, right? But in a great way, the long anchor where we are right now was smaller than a lot of the venues that we played on our tour. We played some giant houses on our yeah, tour. Yeah, I've seen a lot of like Twitters and Instagrams of just like you have like a thousand people. It's almost like a rock show. It's just yeah. like really small, but yeah. And then there's these huge audiences. So it has felt in a really nice way, uh, like a natural return back to a slightly more intimate house for us. So that actually felt really, really great. It's um, also perfect. You guys are back in New York city. I know we love being in New York. It's funny because on the tour, the reactions to the show change depending on what, what city you're in. And that's just like, you know, New York is a very different place than LA than yeah. San Diego. Well, I mean, like the lightning right? thief also takes place in New York. York. Totally, 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 totally. So yeah, no, it, we, it, it, playing in New York definitely feels very special. It also benefits me because I live in New York. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, you had to fly out of. It's funny because I'm from I'm from LA, so California, and B's from New York, so we have that that weird type of vibe. Yeah, so yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, not going yeah. in, in, in your Hades. Without going into any detail, if you've read the books, yeah, it makes for a perfect scenario. Yeah, totally. Now, when it comes to the show, what has been your uh, your favorite character, either in the books or in in the play? What What do you enjoy the most? I mean, I, I I love the general world the most, right? Like, I just love the environment that Rick set out and the way that he plays with Greek gods and Greek mythology, but adapts it to a really modern sensibility. So I think that that has been my my favorite. Um, but I have to admit, I, I have really enjoyed working with Chris in terms of making Chris's Percy for the stage, right? And what we looked for when we were casting this show um, was people with really pronounced personalities that they brought to the stage, right? And so like Chris's Percy might be a little different than the Percy that you had imagined in your head, but I think it's um, it's refreshing to see somebody understand how to use all the things that make them unique go into a performance. So it, it feels very specific to me in a way that I'm excited about. Especially when it comes to adaptation, when you have uh, characters, is there a, what is the challenge? Because you have the, a book perception of like, let's say like a Clary, she's like really in your face and over the top, but it might come off as goofy in reality. What are kind of the challenges of like either toning them back or maybe someone like, like Annabeth, maybe like bringing them in when they have uh, things like my grand plan, like really like opening their heart. What is the challenges with like adapting from one thing to another to like a realistic setting? Yeah. I mean, I, we always kind of looked to the book for clues, right? And that was sort of always at the, um, at the heart of our approach. Now there are, there are going to be differences, but I felt like as long as we were holding on to a central truth of the character, um, that audiences would be allowed to kind of like go on the ride with us. Right. So it was funny. There were things that we didn't necessarily always imagine would be huge sticking points. But then we would hear from social media people commenting, right? Like Annabeth being blonde was like a, <laughs> a huge big deal. And then deal. Going yeah. back to like the movie, that was the one thing they messed up with. Right. And, and, and I, to be honest, was like... 
it's not that important that she's blonde. And we, then we got like a re, like a resounding response that it was like, oh, thank yes, you. her being blonde is really, really important, right? I'm having a feeling backstage someone sent like a huge bouquet of like like blonde flowers. Yeah, 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 like, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's been good that like that we have been allowed to make a couple of missteps, but that through engaging with the audience um, in in a in a kind of good conversation, we've learned sort of what what is um what's really truly important yeah, the, the lighting thief social media presence is like whoever, the best whoever, whoever yeah. like, like we want to know but i guess it's meant to be <laughs> concealed it's the yeah. Oracle, yeah. yeah the, it's the, the infamous twitter that yeah, everyone our, loves. yeah the, that person is rad is yeah. really <laughs> they is do really, a really great job yeah when we're very thankful we're very thankful that our, our that fan base is really important to us right um and it's important to us that we engage with people that this might be their first exposure to it yeah. as well right so balancing that has been really um an, an interesting task now when it comes to it i mean percy jackson is a, a huge fan base uh, what has been some of your favorite interactions either through social media or actually uh, seeing a performance? Because everyone, you know, someone likes um, basically like Camp, Camp Half-Blood or Percy Jackson because they all wear their orange shirts. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, when we first started doing this, seeing people wear their Camp Half-Blood shirts to the theater brought me like so much joy, right? That was such a really amazing thing. But we had a really amazing, um, when we were developing the show for the first time, we invited a group from Camp Half-Blood to come and watch. I forget exactly what the, like, what the exact group was, but it was basically a way for us to talk to like mega fans, right? right? And we were still learning about the show and we had sort of like kind of combined the Aries fight into hate. We were just trying to figure out how we were going to compress everything. And they were really vocal about like, you can't do that. That's not what happened, you know? And so we like had a really early learning lesson about um, uh, the ways in which we had to adhere to the fundamental beats of the storytelling. But adaptation, you're going to do a little, you're going to have to, you're going to have to edit yeah, There has to be out. some wiggle room. There has to be a little wiggle room. Theater is a different thing than reading a book, right? We learned through that kind of conversation. There's this amazing girl there that was like, her name's not Cl Clarice, it's Clarissa, right? <laughs> and we were like, okay, great. <laughs> you know, but like it, it just taught us that like everybody has their own thoughts about it, right? Everybody has their own take on it and that that's going to be a really valuable part in making it. Especially when it comes to that, that healthy balance of finding because again, when it comes to Percy Jackson fans, like we'll get emails and yeah. stuff from people oh like, we'll mispronouncing <laughs> things and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine. And it's uh, what, what is the healthy balance between like the super diehard fans and maybe someone that hasn't seen the play before? Is there uh, trying to work with that? Because I know you guys throw in like little nuggets of truth. Like uh, I listened to one of the songs and they go to the Lotus Casino and they have uh, Nico. Oh and yeah, the yeah, slight Bianca. reference to that. Yeah. yeah, that's been really fun. Is kind of like throwing in a couple little Easter eggs for yeah. diehard fans who know this in and out. Right. Um, uh, and that is that definitely felt like a fun game that we got to play. But, you know, the the plot of the book is is tricky. very straightforward. Sometimes. Well, it's, it's straightforward, but there's a lot of like a lot wait, of detail. We, it's a yeah. lot of detail. And we're like, wait, we who stole the lightning bolt? And how do we explain? Like, how do you get in all of this exposition that doesn't feel like it really just kind of like bogs the show down? So working in that exposition was a, was a challenge, especially sure. with how like the lightning thief is both like it's an interpersonal people working together but it's also a road trip yeah yep. which can be a little tricky at times because normally you have something like vacation which is it's the road trip or you have like the family drama which works really well because you can have things it's a funny you can have drama it's actually it's just greek theater at times you have the pathos and the ethos yeah totally <laughs> totally yeah i mean um it was I think it was helpful for us when we arrived at the idea of, oh, we can cover a lot of the cross country journey in the sort song. of a montage. Yeah, it just song, it goes by right? so quickly, but I I think that it it works because I otherwise it would just sort of bog it's sort down. Of a necessity, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like I love that like the movie spent so much time in Las Vegas, but we like have the briefest, mo you know, like so we did we did respond to content that was already out there right yeah. about it so we wanted to make sure that we were kind of being aware of all of the the ways in which Percy has been represented 
That's that's wonderful. That's always great. Especially this is gonna be amazing musical. We are we're actually gonna see it tomorrow. Yay! I haven't seen it. Yeah, Bryce I, has seen I haven't it. seen it once. Cool. It was it's, great. It's gonna be yeah. wonderful. But thank you so much, Stephen, oh for my God, coming my on the show. My pleasure. It's always it's always a pleasure, especially having someone that can bring these characters to life because a director can bring out performances that are that are so. I wonderful mean, I, and great. I think that I can speak for most of the Percy Jackson fandom that we've waited for an adaptation that like did justice to the story. And I think that the musical does that. Cool. So. I really appreciate that. Yeah. That means a lot to me. Thank yeah. you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. My pleasure. And it, I actually started crying. Like, yeah. This is no, like, there were moments where I almost teared up when the, during, um, during good kid, I, I got a little bit emotional. Cause I was like, I think sometimes we get very intellectual about the books because of the way that we talk how about we them. Feel. Yeah. But I mean, there's something about like how visceral it is to like see, someone acting as Percy, you know, like sort of pouring their heart out. Yeah. Talking about what it's like to feel like he's not a good kid, like that. He just wants to make people proud, but everything, you know, what is the line that he says? He's like, I'm not a, I just want to be a good kid. I'm just a, a good kid who's had a, a hard run or something like that. Something like that. Like he just, just describing like how it's not really his fault that things keep messing up. And I just like, I really felt that like that, that really, like i don't know that that genuinely spoke to what the books were trying to get at in like um like validating maybe some kids who felt like like they were outsiders like maybe you know maybe they, they have, didn't fit in they don't fit in exactly like that's what those those books are for they're meant to you know be like hey do you, hey, have, you have these disabilities yeah. or you have adhd or dyslexia it's right a, those are your superpowers you yeah. know there's normal people they're boring mortals but you're you yourself are a yeah. demigod and there's nothing wrong with you. The world is... Well, I guess in some ways, Good Kid and um, what is the other song that I was thinking um, of? My Grand Plan. Uh, that's another one that I think really captures well, that. Good Kid and Strong oh, are strong, like yeah. sort of two sides of the same co- coin where Strong is really Percy's mom trying to convince him that, that he's like, not different. What, what's different about him makes is, him strong. is what makes him strong is what, you know, like there's, you know, how normal is a myth like the whole how blue food is yeah, amazing exactly the, yeah blue food is weird and that's what makes it good like the sort of the thesis of that whole song is that what makes you maybe strange to other people is maybe the best part about you it's what makes you you and then you know you get to good kid and it's it's like the sad side of what percy actually feels which is like oh yeah well maybe i'm different but i don't want to be different because i'm just trying to be normal and i you know it you can sort of understand feeling both those ways. Like if you, if you've ever been a kid, you've probably felt that way. Yes. And then you get into like one of my favorite songs. I think my two uh, actually might as well just get into what we thought of the the music. Yeah. Yeah, It was like, for me, I think the two songs that really encapsulate actually maybe three is uh, my grand plan, which is that one is so great. It's, it's so great because one, it's almost, it's not, it's almost like a training montage too, where she's teaching Percy how to fight but also she's talking about her frustration of how her mom doesn't really appreciate her. Yeah, using the um the metaphor of the hat of invisibility. Oh, yeah, and like, I thought uh, was it, good. My mom gave me a hat of invisible I can't oh my god. Yeah, she well she says that it's like it's like fitting, you know what I mean? But then like later on in the lyrics she talks about how she, like one day she won't be invisible anymore and that she'll she'll be known and remembered and my like that's- grand plan is that I will be remembered. I've only listened to the songs twice. And I can remember it. It's that's how catchy they are. Yeah, uh, gra- but I think my it's, grand it's, plan is probably is if not my favorite, one of my favorites, just because it really it fires on all cylinders. It's catchy. It does a really great job with the character. Um, the lyrics are like just very cleverly lay out exactly well, how. Yes, Annabeth and I think feels. the most important thing about it is is that this kind of encapsulates who Annabeth is as a character when she's not like in the books. Or, well, what we're reading right now is she's kind of. You know, kind of boy crazy a little bit, but when you break down, like we get rid of that. Annabeth is a person that just wants to be remembered. She wants to be an architect because she wants to be remembered. She wants to do things just as great as the gods. To be honest, though, the reason that she has all sorts of insecurities, even when it comes to Percy and like being jealous of him and when he's with other girls and things, that still goes back to that same motivation. That's her being insecure, yes. her not being noticed. So there's really like the the characterization is strong throughout um yeah there's what is the line that she says where it's just like that she like 
that she has to be she's always been the tough girl you gotta you gotta rise up no that's yeah that's that's hamilton my bad wait it's like um (laughs) yeah i I know what it is it's pretty much like oh you better wise up because i'll rise up yeah so it starts off with annabeth speaking you know the only gift my mom ever gave gave me me is a hat yeah a hat that makes you invisible you put it on and no one can see you seemed appropriate and then she said, I've always been a smart girl, always made the grade, always got, got the, the gold, gold star. star. I've always been a smart girl, but smart girls... Girls only get you get, so far. Get, smart girl only gets you so far. You win at every single game. You want a quest. They tell you tough. If you go... If you don't go, you'll never know if you've been good enough. My grand plan... Okay, so... Yeah. We're, we're pretty much going yeah, yeah. board forward, but yeah. it's kind of like how she, she oh, no, just yeah, wants no, to prove line, herself. The line that I was trying to find was, I've always been a tough girl, always been the one not to run from a fight, always been a tough girl, because most girls never win if they're polite. Like, it's sort of... It totally exactly explains her character. Yes. She's, because that's the way that musicals work, is people They're don't pouring just, out their emotions in a musical exactly sense. They say exactly what they're thinking, because yes. that's what... Because mu- like, you have to suspend the disbelief of, like, no one in a million years would, would, sing. Say, would sing their entire soul to someone who they don't even know very well. But well like, no, there would be, they, like, for us, it would be just, like, an average scene to be... Oh my God, be the toilet is clogged. <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> no, but like, yeah, like, obviously you, that doesn't work in a book setting where people don't like exactly spell out how they no. feel, but the way like that, the function of a musical is totally different. And well, for, for this to be Annabeth's song, it, it works because what she's communicating is exactly like her frustration. It's, it's in character. It totally makes sense. They, they get her character to a T. They understand why she feels this way. She feels Who, alienated. Yeah. She wants to impress her mom, but also she's mad at Percy because he gets to go on a quest and she's been fighting for so like, that's the whole point of the capture flag is that she just wants her mom to notice her. Like there's a part where I think, when Percy wakes up from his bad dream and Annabeth's is like, oh, mom, you remembered my birthday. Like, that was like, and people were like, oh. Yeah, no, like, like a lot of heartbreaking moments. In some ways, um, the musical does a good job of sort of like um, setting up Clarice and Annabeth as almost like. Rivals? The, as rivals, but also as like almost, they're not the same person, but they have like similar issues because of similar circumstances. Like the reason that Annabeth feels like she needs to be so good at Everything. at fighting is because she wants to impress her mom the reason that Aunt, that clarice feels like she needs to be a victor in every fight is because she wants to impress her dad yeah. it's the same thing of like this complex like if you're a demigod either you're like clarice or like annabeth where you're obsessed with winning their approval and then you have percy or- jackson who's just his success is because he simply was born. He was born to it rather than... Yeah. but And then there's, of course, Luke, who he's well, tired of trying to win that. Well, no, he, he went on his quest, but then he even talks about it, how pretty much you go on your quest and you come back and then everything goes back to the status quo. Like, there's yeah, nothing no special about it. Yeah, no a big about deal it. about it. And then he's like, oh, I guess my dad sent me on this quest. Because he liked apples. Yeah, because exactly. Like, there's no even important reason that he maybe went on that quest. I think, yeah, just all the characters really... Just like well drawn, I guess, and they yeah. Um, and even when it so, I think when it comes to it as well as with a lot of these songs is that well, my favorite is Drive because I think that perfectly encapsulates what Percy Jackson can be with the road trip, but also it being goofy and funny. But then you have uh, like the the opening song when they're talking about actually, I think it's like Luke that opens it up. It's like the gods are real. Like the Greek gods, and it's like yeah. they even talk and about they, they have kids, and those kids have issues, issues. and that's and like you, you that's the, the thesis of the entire musical. Basically, is that like the the blowback of having all this responsibility of being a demigod? Is but that then, you but have you never listen to the demigods; you listen to the gods. Yeah, like, this is where you're gonna listen to us. Our side of the story. Yeah, that's like the, I guess, the frame narrative in some ways of what the musical is. Is like this, this is why we're telling you this is because we want you to understand how difficult it is to be a demigod. Or even in, in Percy's song. No, even like when it comes to Percy, like yeah. the, when you first introduced him, the first thing he yeah. says is, hey, I didn't want to be a half blood. Yeah, exactly. So like the prologue. um, or, So, yeah, the prologue is sort of opened by the, the general cast. And then the day I got expelled is mostly led by. Chris McCarroll as Percy, where he's talking about like, oh, if you're if you think that you're a half blood, you better be go to the door. doors. Yeah, exactly. Like it's it reminds me actually of like the sort of um, fourth wall breaking that happened in, in the first book. In in the first book, yeah, where he's like introducing oh, in the demigod yeah, files, exactly. And in the demigod files, it's that similar tone of being like, hey, I really hope that you're normal, unlike me, because being this way is really sucks. I don't know. It just, I really think they got the tone exactly right. Like, it feels exactly... It's what you need it to be for a Percy Jackson, because, see, when it comes to it, you either have 
uh, the movie adaptation, which is just dumb, big, and teen drama. And the problem, though, is you can't really compare because this is, a, I think it's like almost like landing in a bottle because- <laughs> No pe- pun intended. Oh, yeah. Actually, literally, it's landing in a yeah, bottle. Yeah, no, that's like actually what, what the lightning bolt is represented as. It's like it's like a big stage light. Base. I don't know what it is. It's, it's like, like a, an LED it's in, like a, in a cylinder. Yeah. Uh, but- what I'm trying to get at here is that you can't compare this musical to anything else. You can't compare it to the movie because you have people that really love this material. You have Joe Trace, who that man just jumps in the books and it's almost like, I don't know, like a blues clues or like, well, what is like something like you just jump into a he, book? He blue skidooed into yeah, the book. Yeah, he blue skidooed into the book and like pulled out Percy and Beth Grover, uh, Thalia, Clarice, and all those other people and put them on the stage. But you also have people like Rob Rikiki who understand like music and the different yeah, I mean, type of genres the lyrics and i think that without rob you know the no, you musicals, can't no, no. yeah no, that's not to say without rob without everyone that was working no on exactly this. every every moving part was important and everyone i think did like the best they could have and the fun thing an about this though is that there was really little probably involvement with rick riot and he probably was just like yeah go you off got, and go, do your go, thing go wild because he's probably felt bad like he got burned once like what's the worst they could do and this is where they're actually, I, this is almost going to sound blasphemous, but there's some parts in this musical that actually work a little better than the book. Yeah, you said that to me. I, well, we were talking a little bit about how this, there's a scene well, that, when, when they in, find the, in lightning the underworld. Bolt. Yeah, do you, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, there's yeah. the part where they find the lightning bolt and they Percy Jackson, the first thing he does is he accuses Annabeth because she's always wanted to go on a quest and she kind how of bad, like, What does he say? He says, how badly did you want to go on a quest? And then he mutters to himself like, betrayed by a friend. And it totally makes sense that he would do that, right? He hardly knows her. They just met that And all summer. she wants to do is go on a quest. Exactly. She has a motivation. And she, has to, and she had my grand plan, which is she wants to prove herself. Exactly. Like, what's, a better, totally... what's a better way to prove yourself than starting a war that almost destroys the world? Yeah, so it, it actually totally tracks. And I don't think that that's a scene in the book. No, right? it isn't that's a not... scene in the book. Yeah. Percy Jackson would never jump to that conclusion. But that that's the characterization of Percy in the musical. And it actually totally makes sense. Like, as far as like character wise plot wise like yeah that probably is what he would say yeah and it would make sense because it adds like for me having never seen you know you probably heard it last time but for me thinking about it because when i was watching i was like okay because when it comes to adaptions it can be really tricky not to say that what rick riordan had originally was good or bad but here it just it actually threw me off because i had never thought it like this is a different perspective like wait this actually works as like as almost like a drama where you have like wait, this makes more sense because it fits more into the prophecy. And I really enjoyed that. There's a lot of other things that uh, happen like this in the book, but that was like the first one. But also I think when it came to like Luke, like we have, we have a hard time like trying to uh, rationalize Luke and try to come up with him as a person rather than just a crazy yeah, man. Yeah, I guess, yeah, you're, you're kind of right in that seeing him as a flesh and blood person makes it a little easier to be like, I don't like you and I don't agree with you, but I see why you well, are Well, I think the because the are, problem you know? is it comes back to the performance and also what's written you can write something but saying it you can do it differently like the, your delivery yeah well, yeah because it's like an improv it's like you have something like hey guys we're out of peanut butter or guys we're out of peanut butter you yeah know? like your deliver. yeah i think the, because the way the, that- I think the example of that is like on the lake and uh luke is venting his frustration you get it like he's really upset but you because you see it you can feel there's like so much doing. going on in that scene that's like the the way that he's able to convey it his frustration makes it, it makes sense that's yeah the crazy there's, thing. there's the foreshadowing of him being like oh well i you know maybe you don't want to do this for your dad but what about your mom you know if, if she's going to be anywhere she's going to be in the underworld because you know if you know the story that he has ulterior motives for wanting him to well there's the even the part where he like actually i'm He's still he's Aries when he brings gives him the backpack and there's that quick second of uh, beat where they have like the lights turn red and he's like here's your backpack or I forget what it was but it's something like you realize that it's like evil motivation like it isn't like yeah a melodrama. They, they do do they do that kind of stuff where it's like well that's just funny. if you know the plot you're like oh obviously I know like the actual what's gonna happen there, there's double speak happening here because what he's saying is oh well if your mom's anywhere she's in the underworld and, and she's at oh, doa yeah whatever all this stuff that if you're oblivious to that then it totally reads straight and you're going oh well, yeah luke he just you know he's frustrated with the gods but he wants percy to help his mom because he loves his mom but then if you do know then it means something totally well, different yeah. you know it, it like works both ways even when it comes to like the song that i was listening to um on my beautiful walk of the, your amazing lake 
is that uh, DOA, it doesn't work. It doesn't work as like a song where you're like listening to and you visualize yeah. what the underworld no, I mean, looks like. like. We, we talked about this. Like there's a, a lot of things that... Um, it works better like you, you it, sing it, it hinges, visually. It hinges on the performances of the characters, the way that they sell it. also it. depends on like the performances of the character, like Jalen Steele. Like she's wearing this crazy like sequence dress and she's like dancing and yeah. it's like, um, like it's like disco and you're having like a fun moment though. There's only one part that I actually got I actually got taken out of the musical for a second is when they brought in Cerberus that looks like Dead Mouse. That was funny. I think I was thinking that there were probably tons of people in the audience who didn't get that because there's probably a lot of kids that don't know who, that Dead, don't know who Dead Mouse is and there's probably a lot of adults like parents who also don't know who he is. So it's like a very niche joke, but it, I mean it works as like a prop because it just sort of looks like and a you can't have Cerberus costume. on the screen without it being ridiculous yeah but it just, it was like a funny reference because I think if you get it then it's funny but also if you don't then that's just like a funny costume that they decided to do and but also I guess it works because Rick Radden quoted Hillary Duff yeah so, so they're just, they're, there's mouth. some there's some pop culture thrown in there too oh I guess um, outdated pop culture yeah that's true I mean Dead Mouse was their actually maybe their most recent reference because all their other references were dead dead people. people oh except for Josh Groban where it's like do you have any Josh Groban and then of course uh Charon goes we will eventually, eventually which I thought was really funny um yeah just like the delivery of the the comedic lines and I think because really it works because when you have Hades you're thinking of it like the fields of punishment you're thinking of all these terrible things but I guess there's Elysium or Elysium yeah depending on which way you want me to say it I've heard it both ways uh, but then you have like you know the crazy things with, like Janet Joplin, Kurt Cobain, and Mozart. Janis Joplin. Jan- uh, Jan- <laughs> Janis Joplin. I don't listen to music all that much. <laughs> uh, but you you can have like crazy things like that. But then I actually like this depiction of the underworld a little more because it it seems like it's fun. It's kind of yeah. Like I I like this idea that there's well, makes, this like underworld. Well, I guess it's almost <laughs> ironic that Hades Town is just ac- literally just across the way. Yeah. And you have two different depictions of it. Yeah, there's a. But there's not a lot to going not to compare. There. Not yeah, to compare I actually don't know together. a lot about Hayes Town, so I can't really speak too much about the similarities or differences of the. Well, they're they're, they're apples and oranges. You can't yeah, compare you can't them. Yeah, you can't compare. It's but I'm a just saying it's just, it's just funny. Like we're sitting here in Hades, go across the street and you can do the exact same thing in a different environment. Yeah. Um. Is there anything else you want to talk about about the music, or do you want to? No, I think we, I think we're pretty much uh, almost done with this. We've kind of hit all of the songs, really. Um. There's. Yeah, I I think overall I'm just like really I happy think with it. <laughs> if you want to hear my honest impression of this, because for me, I think there was a couple things that were a little off. I think for me, because I, I look for that stuff, like if we're going to talk about the bad, and this is going to be very, very, very small because yeah. uh, my notes were just like, I think some of the lighting cues were just a little missed, but that's because I noticed it, not because... I didn't. Yeah, I didn't really notice that stuff. Again, we talked to Rick and and knowing that they're doing it like by hand with like the in tune with the music and the, about that yeah no I, I mean about that. listen you're I'm gonna give them props for what well, they yeah, did a, but yeah. that's just like for me I have for, to like, yeah so the, the technical issues and then mainly my only gripe uh plot there was, there was wise, a plot there was thing a plot even, hole. even we, I pointed out yeah to we, you. we no we both we both noticed it I think, I think we, we were, actually turned to each other yeah I was like wait wasn't there a plot hole like the thing with the oracle and then yeah me and Zach were were talking walking to the train after the show where I was like wait a second so they they read the actual prophecy from it's, the in book. The, it's in the song it's in the song so it's you know i now i can't even remember what it is. you'll go west face the the god, god who has turned the god who has turned you will lose what matters most and it, what, it doesn't really whatever matter. you you I, guys I, know I, the prophecy i, 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 I don't remember her. i can't remember the prophecy but i can remember uh, i know the gist of what i can remember the couplet in the vile village i could probably do yeah, it right now if you but, want me to but i'm won't. but uh, it ends of course with um you will fail to say what matters, matters most, most in, in, the, in end. the end which is a double meaning as we've talked about the oracle has double meanings well, it doesn't the problem, always though, is they have so how they set it up is that we know that percy's mom dies she doesn't disappear into like a thing of light like she didn't die like it, that's set up in the book but at the end of this it's almost like a melodrama a little bit yeah okay so you, yeah, you fail, probably would explain yeah, it a little better fail, than me. failed matters most in the end the whole point is that oracle doesn't always mean like it's, what it, it says mean, the, the connotation speak. and denotation aren't always the same so what they the actual meaning is as we've discussed way way back when we talked about the book is that what that actually means is percy doesn't really save his mom because she saves herself that's like the gist of it i guess but in this 
There's literally a moment where she's reuni reunited with Percy because he gets her back from the underworld. And what is the first words out of her mouth? But Percy, you saved me. And that is a plot hole because then that doesn't the it makes the Oracle not make sense anymore. I'm, I think Bill Poseidon says, you know, sometimes the gods aren't completely cruel. I'm just extrapolating. Yeah, because, well, yeah, they meet, they, he meets up with Poseidon. He talks about the getting mailed the Medusa head. And no Jimmy Buffett. I was kind of sad. Yeah. And then he says, oh, well, like you, you're getting your mom back, basically. As well, the reward. As the reward for, I guess, getting the bolt back, I guess. That, like, that's sort of like the justification. I, but that's for just it. like when we're, t we're doing a radio camp, Half Blood, like trying to nitpick things yeah I'm that, sure there's probably that's just like, like, we're like the one like, thing i'm sure someone will be able to clear that up for us maybe i feel like the the prophecy is a bigger deal in the books they kind of reference but it's something it you can look over and it's it's fine but it's yeah we have yeah. to we have to talk i, we have I to found address that it. the musical really focused on the betrayed by someone you call friend like they talked about that well, they a bring lot it up like several they bring times. it up several times he repeats the oracle but as far as fail to save what matters most in the end they don't they don't have him repeat that and try to figure out what that means. If that's really, that is truly something that could be fixed by just a line, just him going, Oh, right. You say, or something like getting the, the letter from her mom, from his mom, where he finds out that she turned, um, she turned Gabe into, into a the statue. statue. Like that. Bean dip. Exactly. Bean dip. Like just, you could add like two or three lines in that sentence of him being like, Wait a second. I couldn't save. I, Gabe. I, couldn't, I couldn't save my mom, but she saved or something. Like you know what I mean. I Just couldn't save. Like, my, I couldn't save my mom, but she saved herself. Or like maybe not do, being that explicit or whatever, but like in some ways making that clear and just editing out the part where she says, "Percy, you saved me," because that that's exactly what you shouldn't like. That's maybe like too on the nose of a line. Yeah, you know a little what I mean? bit. Especially I feel like when there's it obviously there's probably like a tweak yeah. you could make for that because yeah, it's that's probably like, just it's only like really a few lines. Like that Percy, could be, is that you? Easily edited. Yeah. And then she runs up to him and then she like hugs him. She hugs him and stuff. And then later when he realizes, you know, he like he might talk to maybe Annabeth and because Annabeth is like the, the quote unquote smart one. She, she might help him figure out what well, the then, meaning then, of then the you're adding you're adding more things to the scene, which I think if you just took that out, I think it would, would flow better. Otherwise, it was a very, very solid musical for me. Again, you have to judge this as was it a good adaptation? Yes, there's things they brought in. There's things they took out of the book. And they they it, streamlined it in ways that it needed to be streamlined. It's funny because it's like we talked we talked about this and how like uh, cause this this play was two hours and five minutes with an intermission, yeah. and that is like this. It felt like we got everything we needed throughout the musical condensing the book because the book might not look big, but if you're trying to condense something, there's a lot of things you can take in, take out, and that can be there's tons really of hard. exposition. There's tons of like complicated Greek god lore stuff that could okay, be really actually, difficult. The, I think that what I brought up yesterday, just remembering it, is that Rick Riordan's book is all infotainment. It's trying to teach you a lesson, whereas the musical is just straight up entertainment. Like they'll bring up funny things, like with Medusa, but you need that stuff to make it have sense. Like even the we had a person behind us while we we're watching it. He even gasped, oh, "That's Medusa!" Like he fi he figured it out. I'm sure he had never seen the. He had read anything, but he realized it like, oh my god, that's Medusa, and then that's when all the things started happening. And I love that. That stuff's great. Because I think, for me, what makes this musical work is that you can go into it without thinking about it. If you've never seen Percy Jackson, you've never even seen a musical, it's fun. It doesn't, again, it was an off-Broadway show, it was a show made for kids, but it feels like a Broadway show. It isn't, that's not like to say anything bad about it. Uh, but it feels like something that's big and it deserves to be on Broadway. As an adaptation, it does work. I think it streamlines a lot of things and make things work better. Yeah, but also I, a good way to put it is I can't imagine a better adaptation of this specific text for this specific venue. As far as a Broadway musical of Percy Jackson, this is this is what the perfect this is, example. This is the perfect version of that. Like we, you could nitpick a few details here and there. Maybe you know some people might prefer like oh if they maybe the sets were different if they if they didn't like the whole black box set. There's like a few. Well, you could that, easily you, have, you could have things minor like minor preferences, that. but as far as like the songs, they're really solid. The lyrics are really good. The exposition, they really they get across in a way that makes sense. The characters feel really lived in. I get the sense that the cast cares about the story. That's been the through line between the cast uh talking to rob talking to joe everybody, talking to everybody talking to everybody you know that they care about the story they, they live it they yeah. breathe it and they want everyone to experience yeah, they, it they care about the fans the people who love the books who you know 
have such an investment in all of these characters who want this this story to be brought to life in a way that makes sense, that's sincere. And, you know, they, they took criticism. We talked to Rob and he said at first they were going to like change some things with the fight with Ares. And then they they had to change it because they, it just yeah. didn't work. And then, you know, people were like, oh, we we don't want that. Or no, was that, I was talking to Rob. No, that was no. Stephen Brackett. No, yeah, when we were talking to Stephen, he said that, you know, they, they workshop things. They had people who were big fans come and see the show. And they needed and to be they, critical. They were not, they didn't hold back with their criticisms. They said, you know, th- here are the important things about the story that you need to keep. Here are some things that you could take are out. a little bit more flexible. And they took that to heart. And they really, like, listened to the people who, you know, are invested in this. The, pe- the fans, people who love yeah, these stories. Think- um, I think as well as when you're looking at this as for me, I do the Walt Disney approach where I'm watching a show. I'm also observing people because for me, that's what I just do in my life because that's what I do for a job is that the show is made for adults. But the most important thing is it's made for young adults and kids and walking through and seeing kids. I saw plenty of little girls and little boys wearing their orange shirts, wearing their purple shirts and mouthing the songs because to them, this is what they love, and this, this is, is Camp Half Blood is real. You no, know, we have the Camp Half Blood. Well, I mean, it's, they have Camp Half Blood Brooklyn, but yeah. this is it, if you can make a kid smile and they forget where they are, you have done a successful job. And I saw that. I observed that with so many of the people coming in, people with like their orange shirts. There was actually quite a few people, and it was nuts because to, just to do that, I think it's. And I'm about to say like think think of the children, but think of everybody in the sense where. It works in this way. It works for fans. It works for people that have never seen it. And for that, I have to applaud. Yeah, I, I understand that maybe it might be in like an acquired taste. It can be you, absurd if, at times yeah, if you're not exactly. knowing what if you're you getting into. If you don't like Percy Jackson, you're not going to like this musical. But that doesn't mean that you won't objectively like the musical. there's something wrong with the musical. It just means you don't like Percy Jackson. Because oh, no, You know what I mean? You, if, you're, if you're judging it on the basis of... This isn't. I don't like YA or something. No, I think that's you know what, what I was trying to say. Is that the problem? Though, is if you're going into it and you're thinking like, if you've see, only seen the movie, if you think of like like Greek mythology, like gritty and grim, like you for some reason you just love Brad Pitt and Troy. Yeah. For some or reason, what, like you go whatever, in there and it's, it's it's hard. It it depends on what your expectations and if like I can't really foresee someone being really into Percy Jackson and, and not, go, liking, and not liking the musical too. Exactly. That's what I'm saying is like, they go hand in hand. You, some people might have gripes with it as well, because you're thinking of it because you're on Broadway, you're thinking of something like the Lion King or cursed child or something that's like a big, big performance, but yeah, you don't like have to need of- that for any Broadway play. Yeah. You don't need that. I think, I guess maybe like going back to it, it's like well, it's like going its own way in some way. Like yeah, and that, it's going they, well, it's going its own way. It's doing its own grand plan. Yeah, it's it's like like this show is like forging a space that I think makes sense for the story. They're not trying to be anything that they're not. Um, I but think, I think that's the most important thing is that even with like the the books, everything has like that camp environment, and it's almost put together. I guess this could sound really weird, but it's almost it feels like it's put together with duct tape and string and sticks because. When you're at camp, that's sometimes all you have. And also you're in New York, which is sometimes yeah, no, dirty that, and grim and yeah, awesome. That like, it, yeah, exactly. That fits the tone and like the ethos of the books. You know what I mean? Like there's there's moments where the prop will be, you know, the big fury that pops It looks up, silly, but and it's, it's like a it's, puppet. And but there, it's what you expect. It's not like animatronic. There's not a lot of complicated moving parts to it. It's just the cast comes along and they like move the wings and everything. Like there's, there's such a big collaboration of people, you know, working together and working synergy. Together, yeah. Like popping up being like, Oh, they're going to be, they're going to do the voice of the squirrel. They're going to be like the, the children. No, I think that's the or- best example of this is the children. Cause you're making a joke about dead, cho- like dead children. And you have these little puppets, like sock puppets. And for me, I was in tears. It was, it, all I can say about this is that I think people should go see it. It's still on Broadway for I think 15 weeks. Hold on. By the time no, this is out, this will be It's a limited engagement. I'm going to look up when it closes just so you guys know the details. Um, but I really did enjoy this. For me, there are parts of this where I actually did cry. For me, I'm not an emotional person, but when it comes to things like this, like it's weird to say, it's like, this is my childhood. But this is like, when you think of like, I, when the first time I went to Punta Hills Mall and for Back to the Future, I kind of teared up. I'm sure the first time I went to Disneyland in a long time, I'll probably tear up. But it's like 
it's like your happy place and you get to experience it there. The second I saw the banner that said Camp Half-Blood, I was just okay. so excited. So it opening night was the day before we went and it's going to be on Broadway until January 5th. So you guys got plenty of time. Maybe it's a good Christmas present. Yeah, that's true. You can go during your Christmas camp break. Yeah, that's true. Um, Yeah, there's... um. Tickets were really affordable. Yeah, especially where we sat. I think it was it was pretty affordable. Um, yeah, I I think I mean, again, helping half bloods is also another option. There are people out there who maybe have an extra ticket who they can give you. Like, there's, you know, if you, I'm not worried because yeah. there's so many seats in that theater. Yeah. You'd be surprised if you love Percy Jackson and you've been thinking about seeing this musical. I'd I'd recommend it. I think it it's really good. I mean, obviously, I saw it back in March. It hasn't tr- changed a significant amount. Um, like when we spoke to to um rob he did say you know there was a quick turnaround on trying to get this onto broadway they didn't they didn't workshop a ton of stuff and change a lot of things but that that's fine i think that the the touring show was really good this is very similar to the touring show except they just have everything a little bit more precise the acting is just a little bit it's like, refined yeah exactly i guess i'm not refined, refined. Yeah. it's streamlined well, yeah, it's both. Like the everyone, you can just tell that these people have been the friends. Re- they're, yeah, they're really practicing. They know each other. They know these characters. They have you know each of the cues down to a science of like, okay, and now we sword fight, and now we're puppeteering, and this, now we're and having now we're like a lighting song. change, and we this is where we because again, small cast doesn't have a running crew. Everyone's doing everything, and like I said before, I didn't notice anything big. Which for me, that's that's actually my job is to notice things, and I didn't see anything. Out of yeah, the norm, which with all like, these moving parts, that, that's well, that's like the most important thing itself. when it comes to theater to a movie. A theater, you have to keep going on no matter what, and if you make a mistake, you have to figure out how to solve it on stage. Which they were refined, they were great, and I think it's one of those where you should go see it no matter what you do. If you can find the money, if you can find time, just go see it. I think it's going to be a magical experience. I'm actually excited for not when it goes off Broadway because I'll be really sad, but when. Hopefully the rights will become available for like high schools and middle schools. Yeah, and I seeing think that, kid performances. That would, that would work very well. I think that would be a, a really good. Because um, I know it was a uh, school of rock after the went off Broadway, they immediately put the rights that, up. So that makes it, so much sense, exactly, because they're kids. So again, I didn't have a major problem with them casting older actors. But I didn't also, have any problem, but I'm just yeah, I'm excited to but, see the future. Yeah, as of actual this. kids, like that would be great, especially because tons of kids are actually fans of these books. So for them to like play these characters, that would be amazing. I mean, we're, when we talked to Rob, he talked about how Joral was a fan yes. of these books and he would like up. beg his mom yeah he would beg his mom to go to the library and stuff like that's that's amazing that you know there are fans of these books who grew up with them who are now like me, a part it's... of the musical i mean we do a whole podcast about this talking about my n- concentrated nostalgia that i figured out how to serialize uh but it's it's wonderful and i'm so excited for you all to see it i think that kind of settles it i think you should all see it this was a really mythical musical i enjoyed it it's one of those that you'll go nuts over you should just drive maybe you might have a grand plan about it trying to come up with jokes right now Uh, you you might meet a a squirrel when you're lost in the woods in new jersey named terrence who has a wonderful theme song like yeah there's just it was like a heartwarming good story i i really liked it a lot um i think i even like i liked it better a second time not just from like everything being a little bit like a little bit better as far as performance and everything but i don't know just seeing it a second time reflecting on it knowing what i was getting into i was um you know i I was really satisfied with the way that the the story worked out and i'll go on record on saying this if they never make a percy jackson disney plus streaming service show and i can die happy knowing that there's actually a good exactly that's the way i feel in some ways because it's not even just about the gift of having something that's an adaptation of well, it's these like, stories. Okay, for me, it's like I want things to be really like making the movie come to life. Like I'll show you dumb things that I like. Like when we were like walking in New York, I was pointing out movie buildings like Dana Barrett's apartment. We went to the New York Public Library. Like so I started doing Ghostbusters. Lines. Yeah, yeah. But it's like this is it literally jumps off it's, the page. It's still, it's it's tangible. still a good adaptation you don't exactly you don't have to be like oh well i'm still holding out for this adaptation because we do have one at least we have this no no you're just saying no 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 no. we have one we have one it's on broadway right now that's what you have an album for it that's what i'm saying it's like they're you know you don't have to be like oh well but this will work as a cartoon adaptation or something well no every adaptation you have is an adaptation to say this is not real this isn't like on a you can watch it on your smartphone well yeah even even beyond just having like the tangible 
result of the musical just knowing that there's a team of people out there that care about the that material. care about it that were like that weren't you know like the people working on the movie who maybe didn't well no most listen, of them are yeah, working for a paycheck you were working for a paycheck or whatever like you you know that the people working on the musical they care about the story they care about the fans they worked really really hard to bring this to life and they have like so such a short time to bring this thing to broadway which a lot of these people, this is their first time on Broadway. I was talking to B about this. We were getting lunch today. Is that this is amazing because every actor's dream or anyone that works on a crew. Yeah. This is their their big break. There's This is a lot of time. I think that it's like most of the cast hasn't been on Broadway before. No, and this is their <laughs> yeah. time to shine. And they are pumping in they're all cylinders. They're knocking out of the park. They did a great job. I'm, and they're not going to ban... They're, they're not going to step down. Yeah. They they feel... um It, it feels... Feels correct. Yeah, it exactly. seems like I'm, yeah. It's almost weird. Like I really wish. I, I know Rick Riordan has talked about it, but it's almost. I'd like to hear just a nice interview from him talking about it, but being honest about it. Yeah, I mean, there's even on his website is you know congratulations, lightning thief for your opening night or whatever. I think there's a reason that Rick Riordan maybe doesn't really like to talk about the movies, but he likes to talk about the musical. I think for him. As someone who brought these stories to life on the page. It must feel really weird. Feel, yeah, I'm sure it's very strange to see it on the stage. But like, I I have a feeling like this person who created these characters, created this world, when he looks at the musical, musical he goes, these people get it. You know what I mean? And they they understand. The, and, and then he looks at the trash fire of the movies like, oh, they don't get it. Well, he doesn't even like to say that exactly. Do you know what I mean? Like, he's just, they... That's maybe all you really want in adaptation is a bunch of people who. I think get the most it. important thing is that I think someone told us I don't remember who, is that it's like they, Rick gave us his blessing, which is pretty much like, quote unquote, you guys did good. Yeah, yeah. That's all. Maybe that's maybe all you need is is validation from the guy who made these characters. Because and he made them for a specific yeah. reason too. He made them yeah. for a son. Yeah. Right. Like it, he has so much invested in you know this world. Who these who these people are. And um, if they didn't do a good job, then he would probably be the first oh, one to say something. Be on I mean, he, he wouldn't be like probably a jerk about it, but like would maybe be a little bit passive aggressive. Probably, probably a like, little, but yeah. it, it, but that's something we don't have to talk about because he, he, they don't need validation from this. The only people they need to validate is themselves because they're the ones putting on the show. They can make it the best they can and they have. And I think we'll just leave it at that because it's a mythical show and everyone should go see it. And if this is for for the people that look at reviews, I'm ours might have a little bit of a bias because we like Percy Jackson. Yeah, of course. But like, but we're trying to be as objective as possible. But here's the thing, though: who cares if we have a bias? No. What is this musical for, if not for people who care about Percy Jackson? No, that's what I'm trying Do to say I mean? here. <laughs> yeah, is like, that it, look? We might have a bias, but the problem though is it's warranted because if it was bad, yeah. we would tell you. Well, I mean, like. You could say this about, okay, if a new Harry Potter book came out and a bunch of, like, reviewers hated it, but then everybody who loved Harry Potter loved it, then is it a success? Yes. I think so, because that's what who it's for to some extent, you know? Well, the, everything, it's like we were, like, driving by a movie theater and they have, like, a Downton Abbey movie. It's like, I'd like to see because I like Downton Abbey, but I haven't seen anything about it. We talked about it. It's made not for people that don't like anything except Downton Abbey. yeah. Yeah, but I think it's it's okay to have something that isn't for everybody. Well, no, it's like, like what do you determine success? I think seeing I saw a little girl there wearing like she had blonde hair, she had her um her hank, cap, Yankee, oh, Yankees, Yankees cap. cap. I said Yankees cap. I was like, wait a second. Uh, well, I saw plenty of Yankees caps because we were on the we train. Everyone was going go anyway, Dodgers. Yeah. Oh no, they didn't say go didn't, Dodgers. Didn't we hear a guy yelling go Yankees? Go Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not in New York until you hear that. That's no. That's, we were also on the train, and they're like, everyone York was like baptism. giving like fist. When we were on the train, someone was giving like fist pumps yeah. to these guys. But but I'm saying is like there was this little girl. She was wearing her Yankees cap. She had her orange shirt on. She looked like Annabeth, and she left that theater with a smile on her face. And I yeah, think that's that's it. And that's what yeah. we're gonna say about it. You had a little girl that you probably just made her night, and that's and that's the most important thing is that smile. And I had a smile. B had a smile. We had a part where we like went backstage and we like did like a like we, predator fist pump. Yeah, no, we were so excited. Well, I mean, especially after like Rob messaged us and, and said, oh yeah, you should come backstage. And You're we, on the list. Yeah, that was like so exciting. You know, we got to run back there and, you know, look at all the cool props. He was talking about all the different lights and everything. He handed us um, some of the cookies. Oh, they were delicious. With the, the little like lightning bolt cookies that someone had made. Like there was, I don't know, that was like a really cool 
behind the scenes look um and talking to rob was really exciting yes i was excited to talk to rob right after the show because you know he still had like the energy of seeing it you know i asked him about opening night and you could just really tell that he's proud i was asking a bunch of nerdy questions yeah yeah, that's true because here's the weird thing like for me when i was doing theater and stuff like that is that is it the second i actually be i actually took a moment to cry because i stood on the stage turned towards the audience and just saw the seats and realized oh my god all these people were watching that show yeah Yeah. and that's the moment where it not not even to brag it's like some people this is their dream and i think everyone worked together really well and i'm yeah just just see it guys yeah see it i mean um, unless you can't get to new york but if you can get to new york if you have take your pegasus yeah that it's 100 percent worth it as someone who had seen it before like i didn't it it felt completely worth it to see it a second time especially on broadway with like just even more energy behind it everyone was so excited you know especially like it opening week everyone's just like you know get hype yeah they're so hype that they're there and yeah it was it was really good i had such a great time i don't know what else to say i think it's i think that's it i, I think, think that's all we have to say so if you want to see the musical just go to www.lightningthiefmusical yeah and you'll be able to get a ticket uh hopefully they'll have pegasus is available in Pegasi. your country or state or wherever you are maybe an ad track maybe don't take a bus maybe don't take a bus maybe don't take a bus uh but see it if not listen to the album i liked it i'm probably gonna listen to it some more well guys i'm zach i'm b and let's keep staying mortal hi guys see ya